Hello and welcome to the Weekly Stuff Podcast with Jonathan Lack and Sean Chapman. We are here as always to talk about stuff this week on the show. We have a lot of stuff to get through, surprisingly. There's a new Star Wars movie. Yes, Solo, Solo, a Star Wars movie. A Star Wars movie. I always want to call it Solo, a Star Wars movie. Yes, it's Solo, a Star Wars story. We will do our spoiler in depth review of that film later in the show. Uh, I actually haven't asked you what you thought of it at all. I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, I have a prediction. I liked it a lot, actually. Hmm. Going in with no expectations. What did you think? Um, I like it. I don't love it. Like, I think it's got. Some issues, but it's probably... I definitely like it more than Rogue One. I probably like it more than Episode Seven. Yeah. But it's no Last Jedi. I it's mean. nowhere close. Like, it, it's it's something where... It's one of those where all these Star Wars movies, there's like... I think on it, it has flaws as a movie, but generally speaking, like, not as a Star Wars fan. I think I would have enjoyed the movie more if it had nothing to do with Star Wars. Because it's it's got some, like, very cloying kind of fan service elements to it that really got yeah. on my nerves. I have, I definitely have problems with the movie, but what I like about it, I like about it so much it kind of just worked for me. Um, but it's, 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 I think it's actually one of the most interesting ones to talk about in the recent run. I agree. Also because the commercial performance, we're recording this Monday night Memorial Day, mm-hmm. and we have the box office numbers in, and it flopped for a Star Wars movie. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, you know, not for most movies it would be a flop, but for a Star Wars movie, this is not what Disney paid for when they yeah. got this four years ago. So, like, Especially since, like, the production issues have meant that, like, the budget is even, like, has ballooned more than it otherwise would have. It's more expensive than any other Star yeah. Wars movie. It, period. It's So it's really interesting to talk about, and we'll get into it, but... That'll be later. We're also going to talk about the Japanese release of Persona 3 Dancing Star Knight. No, dance, was, Persona 3 Dancing Moon Knight and okay, Persona so, 5 Dancing Star Knight. Please. I thought I had important. it. I thought I had it. I'm looking at the fucking boxes and I didn't get it. I you, mean, unfortunately, it's printed in Japanese it on is the boxes. Printed. It's not as easy to just glance at and get that is, it. That is true. Um, but I have played a little of Persona 5 Dancing. You've played a little of Persona 3 Dancing. I, I would say I've played quite a bit oh, of Persona quite a lot, 3 Dancing yeah. Moon Knight. Yeah. And my brother is not here, but he gave me things I should say about them. Okay, good. He gave um, you notes. Yes. Uh, again, my brother, who is the like world champion in dancing, uh, Persona 4 dancing all night. Yes. I can't keep these titles straight right now, it's, Sean. It's confusing. It's confusing. But anyway, we've got new Persona dancing games to talk about. It's a little preview of the Japanese versions of those. Still have no English release. Which is weird. Yeah, like, not just like, there's not no English release on top of that. There's no info about it at all. No info like, whatsoever, yeah. which is is bizarre, but. Hopefully, we'll t- there will be some announcement around E3 just Who to knows? sort of like yeah. tie people over. I don't know. It's weird that it's taking so long. It is. Uh, luckily, you know, there is story stuff, but if you just want to dance, that don't. that Dancing is a universal language. Exactly, yes. And so are, like, non language specific icons that fly to specific points on the screen they have to press yes. at a specific rhythm. You know, yes. that's a pretty universal thing to get as well. Absolutely. We're also going to talk a little bit uh, about some news, including more fucking Star Wars <laughs> news. It's is, never ending. It's never ending. We've got some video game news. We've got some TV news. There's a lot of good stuff today to talk about. Um, but let's start with some stuff, Sean. Yeah. Okay. Is your stuff mostly just Persona related? Yes. Okay. It is, it is 100% Persona related. So. All right. So, I mean, well, then give me your quick, like, 10 second take and we'll do more later. Okay. Uh, I really, really like it a lot. Like, okay. I have only played Dancing Moon Knight. I have both of them, you know, because I spent a stupid amount of money to get, like, the full box set that has both the games and Persona 4 Dancing All Night. Uh, on the PS4 as a download copy, so I have that as well, and the four-disc soundtrack for Persona 3 Dancing and Persona 5 Dancing. So I got the full thing, but I've only touched Persona 3 Dancing Moon Knight so far because 3 is a smaller number than 5, so it makes sense that you play that one first. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so And so I can't speak to Persona 5 Dancing Star Knight. I assume it is structured and everything basically the same way as Moon Knight, just with different songs and characters. But I think it is a great, great game. If you like Dancing All Night, I think it's it's just as good, if not better. It, they cut some corners in a couple of places. Like, there are a few less songs. There are some songs that, that they do videos instead of you dancing to and that kind of stuff. 
So it is clear that, you know, it was a big production challenge to put out both of these games at the same time. So neither one is quite as fully featured as Pursuit of Four Dancing All Night was. But I think the things that they've replaced the story mode with, the full visual novel, with these what they call commues, which I assume they will change that in the localization eventually. But basically, these events that you can unlock where you meet with the individual characters and have like a little like conversations with them and see them interact with the other characters. And those have been really well written, really, really well acted. The game is incredibly funny, um, particularly the Elizabeth character who's the Velvet Room attendant for Persona 3 is so fucking funny, and that performance is just incredible. By, of course, Miyuki Swashiro. So, you know that that'll be. You've a got fuck. a candidate for your award. Yeah, we're already we're already locked and loaded for that. And the remixes are fucking amazing. The Lotus Juice remix is for Persona Three is the best song on both the soundtracks because I've listened to both of the soundtracks. Which one is it? Um, it's for which song? Uh, it's I can't. Remember, it's because the, the song like the name is all in kanji, but it's basically I think it's called like Deep Mentality or something. It's one of the right, right, right. Um, it's one of the songs that plays through one of the shadow events in Persona 3. So it's not like a big lyrical song. And he yeah. just basically takes it and utterly transforms it. And it's kind of a completely unique song in its own right. But it is... That remix is fucking amazing. There are a bunch of great remixes on it. Uh, I'm just having a lot of fun. Let's just talk about these games now. Since okay. you just gave like a two-minute review. We're already on it. Okay. Let's talk about it. So I've play, what I've played of 5... Is pretty much what you're describing. It yeah. does sound like very much a sister game. It has the commues, not a visual novel. Yeah. Um, it has a feature where you can explore the individual characters' rooms, I noticed, in 5. Is mm-hmm. that in the 3 version? Um, I think maybe you have to unlock that, because okay. I haven't unlocked that yet. Yeah, Thomas has been doing that, because he's been getting really into unlocking everything, so he can get his high scores and stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah. I imagine Thomas has played yeah. quite a bit more than I have. Yeah. Now, we do not have uh, the luxury of being fluent in Japanese. Yes. So I, I, uh, I, I think I know a little bit more, but can't quite understand what's going on in the story stuff. Mm-hmm. Again, not that you necessarily need to to fully enjoy the games. No, yeah, like the the way they've structured it is that that story character stuff is now more of like a side bonus thing that you unlock by playing yeah. the main songs, as opposed to Persona Four Dancing All Night, where it was almost like you had two games in one. One was the visual novel, which was like a full like fifteen hour like big visual novel story, and then the the like free dance mode, which yeah. is where you do all the dancing. This like re- these games really put the dancing mode like first and foremost. So if you're someone that enjoy dancing all night almost entirely through the visual novel like these games are not going to be for you yeah so it's a yeah but but if you like the dancing which is fantastic yeah. the persona 5 one i can speak to i've played like maybe like i said eight nine of the songs i've seen my brother play he showed me some of the like best ones with mm-hmm. him playing them on all night difficulty because one thing they've done and i think it's partial sometimes it's a cut corners thing sometimes it is i think they're on ps4 and not vita and they can do more with it is they do more Video heavy stuff. Yes, the, at least in Persona Three Dancing Moon Knight, there are two songs that are basically like the Hatsune Miku music video style, instead yes. of like standing in like a room and having them dance. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, what they do for like specifically when you get to it, Sean, what they do with uh, Life Will Change on the Persona okay, Five one is a fantastic A plus. Are you talking about Life Will Change or Life Will Change the Shoji Meguro remix? The the original version. Okay. I have not played the Shoji Meguro remix version. I'm sure it's cool too, but like the video they have with it is very neat. Um and there are and Persona 5 is interesting because the just the track list of that game has fewer vocal tracks than 3 and 4. Yes. So they're doing more with instrumentals and I will just say like I think listening to the music and and playing the chords that they've put up and everything, they've found really interesting ways to adapt those to a dance a dancing game like this, a rhythm game, and they're really fun. Like, one of the first uh, songs you have unlocked is uh, Tokyo Daylight, a remix, yeah. which Morgana dances to. And it's just fantastic. Um, mm-hmm. It's a very challenging game. I started trying to play it on hard and had to immediately put it down to normal because it was just like, I need to build my muscles back up for this yeah. thing. I, I actually had to do that as well. I think part of it is playing it on a big screen as opposed to the yep. Vita makes it, like, legitimately harder. And the timing feels different. Because sure, of that. Yeah. Like, I don't think it is. I'm just saying, like, you just feel it going to the screen slower, and yeah, I have because to stop you, myself. Yeah, you're seeing it travel a yeah. lot longer distance, and then also it's like, you know, you have to pay more attention to the periphery of your vision, whereas with the Vita, the screen is so small, you can very easily see everything in one yeah. glance. Yeah. Like, I honestly, I might still prefer playing this on Vita if I had a choice, but I don't know. It's, it's not that there's anything wrong with the yeah. PS4 version. They look fucking gorgeous. Yeah, the character models look so good in these games. Yeah, and I can say, because my brother has a 4K monitor, they run in native 4K on the PS4 Pro. Nice. And they look quite good. Um, 
But yeah, so that's what I've played of five. I, I really think most comments will transfer across the two of them. You know, if you wanted to get one, I think it comes down to which game soundtrack do you like more? Yeah. And that sort of thing. Like, I, if I were picking, I would, I really want to play three because there's, I, obviously, I have more nostalgia for three. It's the one that, like, that's the one I've wanted the dancing game out of the most. <laughs> Because yeah. it's the most Lotus Juice heavy? Yes. I will say I was disappointed there is no Lotus Juice in 5. Yeah. In fact, um, other than the specific Atlas people, so they have four remixes by like different Atlas people, one of them being Megro, uh, which in the Persona 4 Dancing All Night, there's only one. I, can't, I think it's Kozuka was the one Atlas guy who had some remixes on that one. Yeah. Um, but other than those four Atlas people doing remixes, the individual artists, including Lotus Juice, are completely separate. So there's no crossover. So, and that's something that's kind of interesting that it gives the the soundtrack for Dancing Moon Night and Dancing Star Night both have really different vibes to me. Not just yeah. because like the source is different, but the people who are doing the remixes are all different across the two soundtracks. Yeah. Um, also, like you kind of brought up with the Persona Five one, uh, you know, the only source for the Persona Five music is just the soundtrack to Persona Five. Whereas with Persona Three, there are songs from Persona Three Portable and uh, Persona Q. On there, which one okay. of my favorites is Persona Q. They do um, the battle music, light the fire up in the night. It's but, so good. But they put um, because if you, you know, you've played the game, I have. so I've only listened to the soundtrack. I so think it I know feels what you're weird say. to say if you remember when I haven't actually played the game. But the there are different versions of the song, the the Mayonaka version and the Kagejikon version, depending on if you played as the Persona Four or the Persona Three people. Yeah. Um, and they have merged those two versions together in the one remix, I and wanna, it's really fucking good. I want to play this three one so badly, Sean. Oh yes. my god. It's. I I have to say I think personally I prefer the Persona Three Dancing Moon Knight soundtrack over the five one. I think there's like I think some of the highs on the Dancing Moon Knight one are a little bit higher than the five one. I will say Thomas, if he has any disappointment with it, what he has expressed is that it does feel like maybe at because it has you know less music overall in its au revoir than yeah. the other Persona games, that Persona Five Dancing Star Night does yeah. feel thinner in its set list. In just yeah. it, it, there's less room they can do because they literally just have the base vanilla game to work with, and there hasn't been as much time for that music to kind of both grow in our consciousness and then be rearranged and, and all these other things. Yeah. I mean, it has, I think, three or four actually fewer remixes than three does. So, it, like, like the Star Knight one is legitimately a thinner game. Yeah. And, but they have replaced that with there are more, like, original... Like, like songs from the original soundtrack brought over for Persona right. 5. So I think there's the same number of songs you actually play, but there are fewer remixes in that version. Yeah, and they've done fun things with the ones that aren't remixes. There's one near the end that's the medley based around Jaldaboeth. That's pretty cool. Yeah. You've, I don't know if you've heard that on the soundtrack, but it mixes a couple of tracks together, but it's not a remix. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. But I, I really do want to play 3 because I'll say I, I love Persona 5. I'm not getting into the waters of which game is a better game. I'm just saying I have more affection at this point in my life for Persona 3 because I've known it longer. And part of the fun, of course, is putting the characters on stage, watching them dance, dressing them up. And what I've seen in the Persona 5 dancing one, this game gives good accessories and it gives good dancing. Yes. Would you say that about 3? 100%. Yeah, it's one of the things that I'm enjoying the most now that... Because basically what I've done in Persona 3 Dancing Midnight if I, is I've played through... Almost all the songs on normal. It's all the songs that you can unlock normally through playing the game. And then I know that there are more songs you unlock, I assume, by unlocking all the Kamu events. And so yeah. I have, I think I have five of the Kamu events unlocked with all the characters. And then they unlock m more that you can get later. Um, but yeah, one of the things that I'm having a lot of fun now going back through on harder difficulties. Or I've played some songs on easy and like just dumped a bunch of the like hard modifiers on it. Because that's one of the ways you unlock Kamu events for uh, Mitsuru in that game. Is going through and looking, okay, like, what are all the cool, like, fashion styles that I can put on the characters and, like, give them something that looks really dumb and weird? Like, I just unlocked the Tanaka mask, yep. so you can make him look like Tanaka, and that's utterly disturbing. And it's 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 particularly unpleasant when you put it on Ken, because he's, like, a oh. 10-year-old boy. Thomas like, was doing wrong. it on Morgana, oh, and it was God. very weird, because it takes him about half of Morgana's body. Yeah, so, yeah, so that stuff, there's a lot of great extras and little features there, and... and but for me, one of the things that has made it so much fun is I think that the Kamu thing, since you know I can speak Japanese and I, I basically get what they're saying. Elizabeth is a little bit hard sometimes because she's crazy. <laughs> so it's yes. like a bit hard to keep up with what the fuck she's saying. So I'm very glad that it's that kind of like visual novel style where all the dialogue is voiced, but it will stop at the end of like two or three sentences and you have to button through, which is very helpful for me to be like, what the fuck did you just say? That's just nonsense. 
Um, but those comedy events, I think, are... I honestly prefer them to the visual novel thing of Dancing All Night. While it is less content, I think it is better presented. And I think it's better for the game as a whole because it incentivizes you to play the dancing game in different ways. Because, as I said earlier, like if you want to unlock some of the comedy events for some of the characters, like Mitsuru, you have to throw on different modifiers or try out all the different outfits or like play you know, and get like a certain number of like a high combo and that kind of stuff. And so them sort of like linking the story stuff in directly with the uh, dancing gameplay is I think a lot smoother than the visual novel Persona 4 Dancing All Night which I liked quite a bit but had so much fat on it you know that was like it, it, there was a lot of sort of like trotting through it to get to the fun stuff and here it just feels like they have pared it down to the kind of nice it's very fan service character stuff but it's like most of them are like two or three minutes long that you get a couple of good jokes in there you get it, Persona 4 or Persona 3 Dancing Moon Knight also has this is something I imagine Star Knight does not have like a weird somberness to it because this game like legitimately just takes place like right in the middle of Persona 3 um, they have been ripped out so here's the story context because I actually assume you maybe don't have this I could have, I, I was looking at the song because the, the, the theme song to Dancing Moon Knight is yeah. phenomenal what's it called Our Moment uh, yes the, yeah, the, the main theme that plays at the beginning I mean like that song is so good it was like making me tear up and it feels like it indicates some themes about looking back on days gone by so I had an assumption about what yeah. this is so, so yeah let, like, let's give you like a bit of like the narrative overview and I assume based on like how they kind of set this up that this Dancing Star Knight is the same way from like the, the other perspective is it's so good. It's so fucking crazy. So you start up Dancing Moon Knight and Elizabeth just kind of pops up and you're in the middle of what she calls Club Velvet and she tells you this story about how um, Margaret, who is the Velvet Room attendant from Persona 4, who is uh, Elizabeth's older sister, uh, has come back to the Velvet Room and told everybody about how her guest is so awesome. They just like had this big adventure and solved like the world's problems with the power of dance. Basically, and so then on um, the Velvet Room, the twins from Persona Five. This is the the story, at least from as far as Elizabeth is telling it. I assume that the twins probably have a different spin on this, but the twins then start bragging about like, oh, our our guest is so like it would be nothing. Like like we'd solve like everything with the fucking power of dance. It would make your guest look like nothing. And so then Elizabeth kind of takes umbrage at that. It's like no, like my Velvet Room guest is the best and they're awesome and so basically elizabeth and the twins from persona 5 are having a like dance contest between the two of them to see who has like the better group of dancers in their their group and like throwing a big party um, that's fantastic each, yeah with each individual member and so elizabeth has yanked the persona 3 cast out of it seems like based on like some events that have been referenced between characters probably around the beginning of January. I think probably after you have made like the sort of critical choice to get you to like the, the end of the game. I think that feels like about round where the characters have been yanked out. And so she just says, you have been yanked into the dream world. You are all in the dream world and you are going, you can spend as much time in here as you like. But then once this like dance, ridiculous dance thing is done, which, by the way, also our magic dream powers mean that all of you are just brilliant dancers, and you can dance just as well as you could dream and imagine that you dance. So you have to—you you don't have like a weird like only fucking like Mitsuru or someone can actually dance because she's actually learned how to dance, and everybody else is bad at it. Everyone's—it's the dream, the the dancers of your dreams. Um, but then once you go back to the real world, you will forget everything that happened in this like magic dance world, and so there's like this weird sort of undercurrent of melancholy with the Persona 3 cast, and particularly because I think, they, they play this very coy, but I think that the Elizabeth that you're with is an Elizabeth from the future, from Persona 3's point of view, because for the Velvet Room people, time, as we understand it, has no real meaning. So I guess, like, I get the impression that she already knows what happens at the end of Persona 3, and all that kind of stuff. How do they handle, like, Shinji? Is he in this game? No, he's, okay. he's dead. They have he's not dead. talked about him, but he's what definitely dead. Because, like, the thing that makes me pretty sure about where the it takes place in the timeline is Yukari and Mitsuru have, like, definitely had their sort of heart-to-heart -heart they have in, like, the November section of yeah. Persona 3. And so it's, like, around that time. Also, unfortunately, Koromaru is not in the game. They, they She specifically says... We didn't pull him into the dream world, and there's actually a pretty fun conversation about like, oh, but the other, the the my sisters did have a cat in their team, so maybe I should have brought in Kormaru. Like maybe that would have worked. 
Uh, That's too bad. I wanted Koromaru to have a dance. Yeah, I think that would have been probably very hard to animate. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? This game costs $60. I want Koromaru in it. Yeah. Dude, yeah. your money's worth Atlas, fucking lazy pricks. Yes, that's they're, they're very lazy devs. Um, actually, one of the things that the this version of the game comes with, with the soundtracks, is a little booklet that has the lyrics, which I do want to read the lyrics to one of the songs, because it's Please. so fucking good. But before that, there are uh, messages from the different staff uh, members of the game. And the creative producer, I think, specifically talks about how just like multiple times says like this was an insane production <laughs> like it's so hard to put like all this shit together and like make these two games at the same time and then they they specifically talk about how um they had to try to come up with this weird narrative shell specifically for the persona 3 characters because you like the persona 4 and persona 5 cast it's very easy to sort of imagine them just having a dance party the persona 3 cast it's like you have to like get some justification in there so it's one of the things that makes the opening of the game a lot of fun is it just feels like you have to get these characters in a space where they're just like it's okay everything like you will it, go back on your like you know incredible like adventure and like death quest to solve, to save the world later, but we can just have a fun dance party right now. But yeah, it it seems like my impression is that this was a pretty hard thing to do to put both of these games together and get all the yeah. remixes and animate all that stuff. And so, like, I have, I'm, I'm basically fine with the little areas of like having fewer songs in in some of the games and having more of the because there are a couple of songs that are not just like the sort of like fully produced music video thing using the 3D models, right. but are like. You know, you play brand new days over the end credits video from Persona 3 Episode I guess, right? right? So that's something they did in some of the DLC for Persona 4, Dancing All Night. But they, there's, I think, two or three songs in Persona 3 that are like There's that. one in Persona 5. This is the one that my uh, little brother already has the number one on the leaderboards on. Um, that is a video from a live performance. That's yes, one there's, there's one of those in Persona 3 as well. They did do yeah. that in Persona 4 with Reach Out to the Truth, I think. And actually, I Wasn't like, that DLC? No, that was the, one of the last songs okay. you unlocked. Was the okay. Reach Out to, if it was DLC, it was like free DLC at the beginning. Right. Um, which also, there, I don't know if Thomas knows this. He's um, gotten the free DLC. Okay, yes, because yeah. there is free DLC of the full three-minute, like full-length versions of the OPs from Persona 3 and Persona 5 dancing uh, are only, like, free DLC for some reason, which is weird. I don't yeah. know why that's not, like... Because that's also one where it's a video, and it's not a fully, like, dancing thing. And that's that's one of the areas where it's like, that just feels... It's, it's bizarre. It's, it's, little... it's weird, and it's just kind of disappointing. Yeah. But anyways, I think to close out this conversation, I want to read you the, the lyrics. I think I'll just do, like, the sort of the beginning and the, the first two verses of the Lotus Juice song from Persona 3, which I can't read the, the kanji except for the second word, which is Shinri. So, you know, the okay. title's not important. Anyways, here we go. I can see through it. I can see your movement. I can see through it. I can see the bullshit. Deep down, what you want to do? Actually, I already knew. Recognized what runs deep inside. Emotions you want to hide. But you can't pretend forever. Know that I see through it. I can see your movement. Stop your bullshitting and stay real to it. Soon I'm gone to a better place, hoping what I left behind becomes a better place for y'all. You can lie to yourself and get lost in this Tartarus. So murderous, self-inclined Spartacus. Don't lose sight of what the purpose is. Hold me back. Don't let me come back for ass spank. Realize (laughs) things look clear from where I'm standing. Take a breather. Check your status. Simple mathematics. Out of balance. So stop faking yourself. Did he rhyme Tartarus with murderousness with purpose with what else there? No, it was Tartarus with murderous with self-inclined Spartacus, which I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, with, yeah, and then its purpose is, it's hold me back, don't let me come back for ass spank. I, he is the greatest, I want Lotus Juice to be our president for life. Of the world, I'm not yeah. talking America. All countries unite under Lotus Juice, he gives all speeches in the form of rap, he would be he would be a uniting influence. There would be no more war. He would make us all happy. There would be no more famine. Everyone would come together under the power of Lotus Juice. Yeah. He is the one true God. I feel like if if we could determine what the fuck he means when he says says self inclined Spartacus, I I feel like we will unlock the truth of the universe. Yes, yes, I love that man. I I love. That you and I can, you know, we legitimately think Persona 3 is, if not the greatest game ever made, one of the greatest, you know, one of the most significant works of art of our lifetimes. Yeah. And there is a spinoff to that game 
that we also think is pretty cool, where the phrase ass spank is used. Yes. Just, I mean, that's pretty great. Eat your heart out, Citizen Kane. There's no Citizen Kane dancing movie where, you know, Orson Welles is talking about ass spanking. Yeah. No. I yeah. also do like that for a couple of the songs, for like two or three of the new songs, um, the, the phrase y'all, like why apostrophe A-L-L is used. And it's like, I, it, there's something weird to me about... I know that these lyrics are actually, like, Lotus Deuce writes his own lyrics, but then the other ones are written by native English speakers that work closely with Shoji Megaro and everyone, but it's still weird to me that there's a Japanese game that has, like, three or four songs that use the word y'all in it. It's <laughs> great. Like, it's weird. I don't know how Last that Last thing, I just want to say, the special edition you got, that's a handsome fucking box. Yes, it's very nice. You got it on the table, we're looking at it. Yeah. It is, uh, it is glittery and handsome and yeah. cool. The, the soundtracks are very nice. And they are, like, really comprehensive soundtracks. Um, the one thing, they do, they only have the 90-second version of the opening themes, which is really weird. I don't know why. It's, it's not a big deal because the second verses are basically the same. Like, they don't really change up the songs much. But other than that, there's also quite a bit of music that is just, um, you know, like the... Because even though it doesn't have the full visual novel that Persona 4 Dancing All Night had... It still has music for all those commu events that are original instrumental tracks, and all those are on here as well. Nice. And some of those are really fucking good. Okay. So it well, is a soundtrack well worth getting, not just for the remixes, but some of those instrumental tracks are also awesome. You know, I'll put it this way. We had a pretty obvious theme song choice this week. Yes. Uh, we don't for the next couple of weeks, and so this came right in time, Sean. We have got a lot of Persona music to play on this podcast. Yes. I have been listening to the thirty second, the first 30 seconds of a lot of these songs very avidly, thinking like, which ones of these are, would be good for the podcast opening? All right. We've got a lot of E3 coming up. We do. All right. Let's do some news, Sean. No, we're not at the news yet. I have stuff. Yeah, what's been going on in your stuff that's not Persona 5 Dancing Star Night, Jonathan? I've been really busy and I haven't had time for stuff. That's kind of it. Yeah, I mean, that but, was mostly my stuff as well, and then this game came out, and I got it on Friday. So that's been my weekend. Let's so, just play this. I have had almost no time for video games. I have played a little bit more of Shin Megami Tensei's Strange Journey Redux for the Nintendo 3DS, which right. I talked about last week. I still love it. I think that's an amazing RPG, but I'm only like seven hours into it now. I was like three last time. So I'm going very slowly. Has I, anybody wrapped the word ass bank yet? No, I mean, there's no wrapping in it yet, oh. which is too bad. But yeah. it does have a killer Sh- Shoji Meguro soundtrack. Like, good. A+, plus, that is a good soundtrack. Love it. Um, I really do enjoy that game. I don't know if I have anything more to add from what I said last time, other than there are just, there's some, like, it really is the feeling of, this. The, as I said last time, the structure of that game is, it's kind of like the movie Annihilation, where there's this weird event, it's not a shimmer, in this case it's called the Schwarzwelt, that is open in Antarctica, and you and this team of people from all these different countries are going in to explore it, and things go wrong, and you're basically stranded in this weird dimension that has appeared on Earth. And, like I said, a lot of JRPGs are about, you know, going on an adventure and exploring, but in a world that has pretty clear, like, boundaries out there for you. Yeah. This is one where you really don't know what's behind any corner. And there have been some absolutely, like, batshit moments so far. Uh, I got to the scene where they introduced the... As with most Atlas remakes, they've done this big thing where they've added a new character into the game who has her own sub-dungeon kind of thing. But the introduction of that character... You should just YouTube it if you don't want to play the game. It's fucking insane. I, I can't believe I, I saw what I saw, and mm-hmm. I love it. And that was really cool. So, yes. But I've had very little time with it. I also did on Friday pick up Dark Souls Remastered, as I promised. It's, you know, they remastered it. Yes. It's on the PS4. It's easy to play now. It's in 60 FPS. Looks very, very nice. I'm like, I'm going to try Dark Souls because I don't understand what that game is. Okay, yeah. I don't understand. You talk about it, and it sounds cool, but I don't get it. Yes. And so I tried it. I don't get it. What is this game? Because it's cool. Yeah. I enjoyed my time with it. I, I, so there's the opening like tutorial section in the like asylum thing. Yes, the Undead Asylum. The Undead Asylum. And then you get to Lordran. I have made no progress in Lordran. Because okay. it just drops you. It tells you nothing. It tells, I have to go light a beacon. Uh, that's so all have, I know. Have you gotten to the Firelink Shrine? Yeah. That little, okay. In Lordran. So like the yeah. first place you go is that Firelink Shrine. And then it's just... Do your thing, I guess. And I've, like, explored around, and I'll die, and then I'll be back at the Firelink Shrine, and I won't know how to get back to where I was. And I'll explore a different direction, and I'll die, and then I don't know how to get back there. Okay, and yeah. there's no, like, indicators or quest log or anything. And I'm not saying that's bad. It's just, like, I legitimately... I feel like I need to ask someone what I actually do in this game. Okay. So do you want me to sort of, like, 
Start laying this out a little bit, maybe. Okay, because it is. You know, I've enjoyed. You know, like, like I'm getting. I'm like, okay, this is what the combat is like. You yeah. Know, okay, I've got my. I chose to be a pyromancer, so I've got like my fire. Okay. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's interesting, but uh, yeah, I don't know what's going on. Okay, so when you get to Firelink Shrine, basically, like, because one of the things that's interesting about Dark Souls is you can kind of go with a couple of exceptions. You can go to most of the locations in the game. As soon as you get to Firelink Shrine, um, several which like you, there's nothing really for you to do there, or you can't quite get like all the way through because certain paths have not been unlocked. But generally speaking, there are two areas you need to go to, and and you need to ring two bells, one above and one below. I think there's probably a character that has told you that. Yes. I've been, like it's, I have not played this game since like 2012, so I'm I going said, off of a lot of memory. I said light a beacon. I probably meant ring a bell. Yes, so. ring a bell. Um, and you want to go to the one that's above. First, which is the I can't, I can't remember whether it's like Undead Burg or something is what. Okay, I did get there, and I died and couldn't. Get, and I had so much experience, and I was sad. Okay, anyway. yeah. So because it is like this uh, little like kind of city area where there are a bunch of undead zombie enemies that you have to kind of work your way through and fight a couple of boxes, bosses and work your way up to the top and ring that bell. And that's like the. So you already had the tutorial in the asylum, but th- going through the undead berg is like the okay. You've actually now learned the lessons that this like you need to to do the kind of like loop of the game, which is so that's like the first kind of like closed loop where you encounter a couple of bosses. You get a sense of the you die. You get as far as you can, and you're and, and sort of like get your souls back and try to push a little bit farther and learn the geometry and learn the area. Learn because the secret to Dark Souls is. Learning those levels, learning the layout of those levels, and learning how to maneuver them efficiently while avoiding enemies or engaging enemies in combat effectively without taking a lot of damage and unlocking different shortcuts. That means that the next time you die and respawn at the bonfire, you know you now know how to get back to where you were faster and in a way that you don't encounter as many enemies so you don't take as much damage. Okay. And so I was going the right way. Yes. All right. Yeah. I felt like I was in a good groove there. But then it was like, again, I have had very little time, but yeah. it was, yeah, it was confusing. Yeah, because, like, my main piece of advice would be the, like, don't let yourself get too frustrated early on. Like, and if you lose souls, forget about it. Okay. It's like, like, you will get more souls. It's not that big of a deal. You know, like, leveling up in this game is helpful and you want to be doing it. So it's, like, not, like, never level up. But it's not the most critical thing about the game. It's much more about... Um, getting a weapon that you like and like are good with the move set and upgrading that weapon, which you haven't gotten to the blacksmith yet, so you can't upgrade your weapon yet. But once you, which that's something that you unlock over the course of working your way through Undeadberg, um, once you get that, it is way more about upgrading your weapon and, and learning that stuff than it is about getting your like decks up by one or something. I think I just need like a solid evening that I can set aside a 100%. couple of hours and just be with the game and say this is what I'm doing tonight. And I haven't had time for that yet. Yeah, so that's that is what you need because it is a style of game that is very unique. And even though there have been some like other smaller games that are clearly inspired by Dark Souls, there's still nothing quite like you know the Demon Souls, Dark Souls to like Bloodborne, Dark Souls Two, Dark Souls Three, like that lineage of games from From Software are still incredibly unique and very weird. And so you have to learn the language of the game and like the loops and the kind of stuff you need to do from playing the game. It is there's not a lot of sort of knowledge or experience from other genres and other games you can play that you can apply to this one. It's and I've started, I have seen a little bit of that because it's it is a it seems like a bit of a Trojan horse of a game and how it looks because it looks like you know a Skyrim or a Dragon Age or something, sure, and yeah. it makes you kind of. I, I, I knew going in this time that wasn't going to be the case, but I think the first time I tried Dark Souls way back in the day on the 360, like I, I don't, I don't know if I rented it or if it was on Games with Gold or whatever. It might have just it. been that we, that might have been when we were in the condo together. So you might have just yeah. played my copy. Who knows? But like, I didn't understand what the game was um, because yeah, it does. It, has, it does not have a dissimilar graphical style from like a Skyrim or something. Yeah, it's so like that sort of high fantasy yeah. RPG sword stuff. Yeah, but of course that's not what the game is at all. No. So anyway, I have found it interesting. I will say, you know, if you if you are in the market for a remastered Dark Souls, I can't speak to the original other than I know the famous like you know the problems with frame rate and stuff. Yeah, this is a rock solid port. It looks fantastic. It you know full 1080p on the Pro. It can do it in 4K. I don't have a 4K TV, but you know it up samples and looks nice. Full 60 FPS, never seen a single drop so far. You know, it looks very good. I'm not in Blighttown yet, but I've seen the video. People have yeah. done it, and it looks like it's fine. So yeah. that's really cool. It's it's nice when games get preserved in better fashion. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it, it is something of if you're playing like for you, Jonathan, or other listeners of the podcast that are playing Dark Souls for the first time, don't like like if you're getting really frustrated, don't worry about like like look up a YouTube video or like a fact or walkthrough or something to like help you out at the beginning. I think that's totally fine. Yeah. Like don't like don't because because you need to learn the rhythm of the game, and once you do. I think you'll probably really like it, but it is sort of like a hill to overcome. Yeah. And so, like, I didn't get into Dark Souls until I watched some, like, videos that were other, like, Let's Plays, basically, of other people playing Dark Souls. And let me see, like, okay, I kind of get this. Because I tried Demon Souls when it was on PS3, PS Plus, and played that for, like, eight hours and didn't quite get into it. And it was after seeing those people playing Dark Souls and kind of getting a sense of, okay, I learned the sort of the language and, and how to kind of look at this stuff. And then took a crack at Dark Souls and put a couple of hours into it. And then finally I was like, oh, I fucking see it. Like, I get I get what this game is doing. And it's yeah. just something that you have to overcome that hurdle. Yeah, I'm very interested too. Because it is a one of the more significant pieces of, like, current video game zeitgeist that I just don't understand. You right, know? Yeah. And I want to understand it. So, I'm glad they did the remastered version. It's a much more accessible way to get into the game. Yes. I also say, it loads lightning fast. That's you good. die, which is great. Yes. It, it already loaded pretty quickly, uh, but it is good. Of, like It being faster can only be better, because you yes. die a lot in that fucking game. Yeah. Particularly early on. Yes. Uh, I am I'm in favor of faster load times in general for things. And we've Absolutely. been in an era where load times have gotten slow again <laughs> for a lot of games. So yeah. it's like, it's nice. Yeah. But anyway, that's... It, uh, it would be very exciting if you really like Dark Souls, Jonathan, because there are a lot of Dark Souls games that you can there play are. now. There are. Two and three are very cheap if I want to go get those. Yes, yeah, you know? Bloodborne is, yeah. With all good. their DLC. Uh, I've got Bloodborne because of PS Plus. Right, so yeah. I got I got all the Dark Souls if I want to. So, yeah, you get way into it. You've got, you're like covered for like half a year of video it is, games for It's you. very nice. All right, you want to do some news, Sean? What's going on in the stupid news, Jonathan? All right, we are going to do two pieces of movie news. Okay. We're going to do three pieces of video game news. Okay. And two pieces of TV news. That's that's a lot of news. That's the order. First off, we'll just lean into the Star Wars right away. Okay. I know that's what you guys want. Yeah, you, we're not going to load it as a segue later on. It's just like, just dig into it. No. Uh, all right, so it was reported in The Hollywood Reporter this week that James Mangold, the director of Logan, also the director of... Uh, Walk the Line, the Joaquin right, Phoenix, yeah. Johnny Cash movie. He did the great 310 to Yuma remake. Very good director. He has been hired by Lucasfilm to write and direct a Boba Fett spinoff movie. Uh, this has obviously been an open secret that they have been working on this since they got Star Wars. Disney got Star Wars. Uh, this is reportedly the Star Wars movie that the guy who the guy who got who did the Fantastic Four, that crappy movie, Josh Trank, Josh Trank, yeah. that he was fired from, was trying to do. Right, and we also knew that Simon Kinberg, the producer and writer behind a lot of the recent X Men movies, was working on a script that might be for previous incarnations. James Mangold, it has been said, it's he's writing and directing it, so he might be coming in completely fresh onto this. We don't know, but that's what we have. Sean, two questions. <sighs> okay, yeah. Why does Lucasfilm? <laughs> What a Boba Fett movie so fucking badly. Two, after the opening of Solo, this is, there any, is this movie getting made? No, I, I don't think so. It, it would be insane. Not. Like, it would be cheaper to just throw your money in a furnace. I mean, if you can't get people in the theater for Han Solo, Chewbacca, and Lando Calrissian, I'm sorry, you're not getting people in the theater for Boba fucking Fett. It's so just, it's something that I could kind of see this... If it was like 2008 or 2009, yes. and and in that nerd culture, there was I think there was still the cachet to Boba Fett. There's still the mystique to Boba Fett. When Star Wars as a franchise and an entity in that sort of like premiere movie format was still a very rare thing, which is like we are almost up to as many fucking movies in the Disney era of Star Wars as there were in the pre-Disney era of Star Wars, which is fucking frightening. Um... It really, truly is. No, it is. Yeah, but yeah. Back when when Mar Star Wars like cinematic movies were a rare thing, I think the idea of like a Boba Fett movie, there would be people excited about it. I probably would have been excited about it when I was like fifteen years old. Now, who the fuck? No, no. Like I can't. I can't take it. Like I. I would not have. Like this doesn't even speak to the quality of the movie or anything. If it was not for this podcast, I would have never gone and seen Solo, A Star Wars Story, because I just watched a new Star Wars movie fucking five months ago at the movie theater. It's like it's like the one blessing of this movie, of Solo having coming out, come out in like late spring, is that we have a year and a half until the next Star Wars movie, so it's like I get to rest for a little bit. 
I can't, I can't care about a Boba Fett movie. It's just impossible. There's no way. He's not a character. There's nothing to him. It's a cool design. And that's it. Yes. There's no, there's no movie to be made with Boba Fett. Just give up and do something else. It's so stupid. And, you know, to be clear, I like James Mangold as a filmmaker very oh, yeah. much. I don't think I've ever seen a film of his that I didn't like. I really do like his movies. And I also, you know, I follow him on Twitter. He got into an argument with me once where I was actually trying to agree with him. That was weird. But I like yeah, James Mangold. Twitter. I like his movies. I want to see him do more stuff. I also think that as someone who I think has very real revisionist modern western bona fides that if you wanted someone to do a star wars you know western style thing with a bounty hunter person he's probably one of the people on that short list for good reason you know yeah. but i don't care about boba fett yeah i don't know if james mangold cares about boba fett because who cares about boba fett i know there are some very rabid fans who think he's really cool and good for them that's fine i think you've probably been serviced enough with endless comics and books and all yes, that stuff yeah. I don't see why you would want to do this. And, you know, you can make the jokes about it. It's just weird business sense. And I do think Solo this month has thrown into stark relief. The people in charge of Star Wars, I'm not sure they understand Star Wars. Yeah, it, I, yeah, I, I feel like some this of the, franchise is being mismanaged. I think some of the filmmakers understand it very deeply. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. I think Ryan Johnson does. I think... You don't have to like Force Awakens. I think J.J. Abrams has tremendous affection and understanding for Star Wars. Yeah, of course. I think everyone who has. You know, even like, I think Ron Howard did a great job on Solo, like, doing world building and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that kind of, you know, behind the scenes enthusiasm. But like, you know, the, the Lucasfilm and Disney people, you know, the main uh, person at Lucasfilm right now is Kathleen Kennedy. And Kathleen Kennedy is a great producer. I'm looking right now at her Wikipedia oh, yeah. page. If you look at the list of things she has produced... Because she was like a big partner with Spielberg, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and with Frank, her husband is Frank Marshall, who's a major producer in, in the like 80s, 90s era as well. It is hit after hit after hit. Phenomenal movies. You know, she, you know, as associate producer, producer, executive producer on... Just, like, you look, go down this list, it is an insane number of both hits and great movies. But she doesn't have a Star Wars movie on there until The Force Awakens. Yeah. Like, it's not her thing, necessarily. And also, producing a franchise like this is different than producing a movie. Yes. Right? Like, like, you're, like, this sort of, like, franchise manager more than you are... Yeah. The custodian of an individual film. Right. So, you know, you compare this to, like, Kevin Feige over at Marvel. Yeah. And I think part of why Marvel's worked so well is that Kevin Feige directly comes from this world. He's a Marvel guy. Also, you know, a talented film producer, obviously. But this is, like, his thing. Like, if he had a choice of the movies he would be making, I think it would be this. Yeah. I don't know what's in Kathleen Kennedy's mind or heart or anything. And I'm sure she, you know, likes Star Wars and wants to make good Star Wars movies and all that. But I just don't know if, like, that's the, the world she comes from, necessarily. Um, you know, because Star Wars was such an insular thing before this Disney merger. It was George Lucas was in charge of that. And he let a lot of other people come play in the playground. But it was, Lucasfilm was George Lucas, right? Yeah. And, you know, he and, uh, I should say, he and Kathleen Kennedy had worked before. It's part of why the deal went through is that they were friends. You know, for instance, I think their big point of contact was on the Raiders of the Lost Ark films, the Indiana Jones films yeah. um, they did together. But it is just a weird thing where... You just get this sense of like they're not they're not being guided by like Star Wars is a big cool universe. What stories do we want to tell? They're being guided by what do we think the fans are foaming at the mouth for most? It's like they looked at like a Facebook character popularity poll for Star yes. Wars from like 2011 and are it, based all their movie making decisions off of that. It really does feel like that. Like you know, I think the sequel trilogy has just by virtue of getting to be its own thing has gone on further branches and, you know, done its own thing more. But the two, like, spinoffs so far were the two most thuddingly obvious Star Wars movies you could have yeah. possibly made. The Death Star Plans movie and the Han Solo movie. The Death Star Plans movie ran into a lot of problems. The Han Solo movie ran into a lot of problems. People have very varying opinions on the quality of the films. I like one of them a lot, and I don't like one of the others a lot, and, and you feel different, you know, so yeah. everyone feels differently about them, and that's fine. I just mean that clearly, these were not easy to get on the screen, because I think the first thought was not, where's there a great story in the Star Wars universe? The first thought was, what do we think fans, like, in pandering terms... What do we think, you know, Star Wars kids living in their parents' basement want? That's kind of what yeah. it feels like. And it also feels just completely ignorant of 
the world of Star Wars fiction outside of the movies since 1983. Like, yeah. it feels like that's where they... The character pull thing, Sean, I don't think it's 2011. I think it was like 1985 is where they got sure. the character yeah, pull right. from. Because, again, like, old people don't like the prequels. There's a lot of young people who like the prequels because they fucking grew up with them. Yeah, you know? like, you know, us. Like, like us. And go listen to our rewatch of the prequels podcast. And there's a whole world of expanded universe stuff that people have embraced. And I think it makes complete sense for the, like, episodic sequels to have to do what they have done in general in, like, timeline. And we can d- debate about certain pieces of, like, world building in the background. Yeah. But a direct sequel to Episode 6 at 30 years later, that's probably what you should do for Episode 7. Sure, yeah. But outside of that, it just makes no sense, in part because... And this is another part of the fatigue, no matter how much you have liked these Disney Star Wars movies. And I like three of the four very much, and I'm vocal about that. It is impossible not to be fatigued, because hype is not an endlessly renewable resource, and every single one of these movies is set in the aesthetic world of the original trilogy. Yeah, they all every... are kind of like a bit dark, a bit grimy. They yeah. have like the, the designs and everything of the original trilogy. It, it is something that's just like... It's, I think it's really interesting to compare and contrast the what because it's both Disney is like the Star Wars thing and the Marvel thing, and it just feels like the Marvel Cinematic Universe has this limitless potential that they have developed for themselves because they have branched out into so many different subgenres for their movies, so many different styles, and you know you have something like Guardians of the Galaxy, which is so bright and colorful and fun and beautiful and weird and crazy. And then you also have something like, you know, Captain America 2 or, or Civil War and that are a lot darker, a lot more brutal, a lot more sort of like violent in dealing with like, you know, like political themes and that kind of stuff. And both of them are really good movies and they both exist in the same universe and you can tell that. But the movies and the characters have their own style and aesthetic and subgenres kind of associated with them. And they've utterly well, failed to do that with the Star Wars stuff. All the Star Wars movies feel like they are, they exist in the exact same like really small sphere when it doesn't need to be like that, as someone who's been a big fan of Star Wars my whole life, it's like, it doesn't have to fucking be like that. Like, you can have the original trilogy, and the prequels, and Clone Wars, and the video games, and the comic books, and they can all be, like, weird and different and have their own shades of Star Wars and still be Star Wars. Yeah, I mean, I showed a friend of mine this weekend who has no interest in superhero movies, no no knowledge of Marvel, no, she's, she's just not on that wavelength. Yeah. Showed her Black Panther, because she was very interested in that, academic friend. And loved it and was really into it. And I just said, I gave a quick preamble about the events of Civil War to say, like, T'Challa, you know, his dad's dead and he's coming back to take over Wakanda. Like, yeah. you know, and that's all you have to do. And, and even that, like, fine. you basically could get from the movie. Yes, you could. But she loved it. She does not then need to go watch Infinity War or anything. Yeah. She might watch Black Panther 2 or something. She doesn't have to go back to understand those. That can draw in people who are not interested in the others. You know, the Marvel model is that along the way, people might come in and out and might be new fans. You might have a base of fans that are going to go to all of them like us, but you don't need to. And so it is a durable brand with also worldwide appeal because some of the Marvel movies play better in different parts of the world for various kinds of cultural tastes, yeah. right? And that's something that avoids that sense of fatigue because yeah. it's something of where there have been what three Marvel movies that came out this year? Two, two so far. Two, and Ant Man is coming out. Yeah, in July. Ant Man's coming out soon. It's like I'm super. Like I saw the trailer for Ant Man and the Wasp before Solo Star Wars Story, and I got really excited because it's like it fucking good. Lawrence Fishburne is in that the, the second trailer, and he's Goliath. I'm like, that's fucking awesome. This looks like a big fun movie. And it's like if there had been a trailer for another Star Wars movie before Solo a Star Wars Story, I would have fucking killed myself in that movie theater seat because it's like I can't live in this world anymore. What the fuck are you people doing? And there really is no way to look at the situation with Solo and not say the brand has been mismanaged. Again, this is separate from the quality of the movie. But to just but you just look at it and you, and collapse of box office. You know, it made yeah. The Last Jedi did 220 million in its opening 3 day. Solo did 83. Mm-hmm. It collapse. It, you know, Box Office Mojo did a long article projecting what its final worldwide tally will be, including domestic. It's probably not going to break 600 million. Like, it will not make a profit in theaters. Yeah. And that is bad. That is for Disney bought this property for $4.5 billion. They've done four movies in four years, and the fourth one flopped. That is kind of, if you're a Disney executive today, you're probably horrified. Like, yeah. what did we do? And what you did is you just thought, if you make more movies like A New Hope or something, like Star Wars movies, narrowly defined, then people will come to them every time at the rate they did Star Wars in 1977. Yeah. And it's weird because it feels like they were they had a blinder on for the business model that is manifestly more successful right next door yeah. with Marvel and said... 
And so instead of trying to build Star Wars into something like that, which Star Wars could easily be a big, durable model like that. Oh, absolutely. But that's not the goal at all in how they're trying it. And clearly, if you look at all the ideas they have on the board right now, I mean, we don't know what the Ryan Johnson trilogy is, and we don't know what the Game of Thrones guys trilogy is. I don't. I have hope for Ryan Johnson because I think he's super smart. The Game of Thrones guys, I don't know. But you know what else do we know? We know they're doing an Obi Wan movie, which I want. But also, like, it's still is in this sphere. Yeah. But at least the Obi Wan movie, you have fucking Ewan McGregor you to hang your McGregor. hat on with that. Yeah. Where it's like you don't. You know, I I thought uh, Aaron Reich did totally was great in in Solo, but still. It's like there's no it's Harrison Ford is not in this movie, you know. Right. Like Mark yeah. Hamill's not in the like you don't have this like character performance that you already are closely associated with carrying over. Yeah. I think there's like the one shining thing about a potential Obi Wan Kenobi movie is like I really like Ian McGregor's Obi Wan yeah. and I will I want to see that performance. There's again. nothing like that for Boba Fett. <laughs> no, God, so, no. So <laughs> I mean close. if their if their plan is I I really do wonder they have a year and a half to get this together right now because yeah. They, they have to figure out how to get the hype back into this without everyone being fucking exhausted. In a part also because I think The Last Jedi is a brilliant movie. The Last Jedi pissed off a lot of people. Yeah, it was very divisive. And I'm worried about how they go from here with that. But they're going to do episode 9. They have a year and a half for everyone to cool off. I think they have some real decisions to make after that about mm-hmm. how aggressively they push this. If Because I think if they do episode 9 and then six months later have a Boba Fett movie in theaters, <sighs> that movie is going to be an, a bomb of epic proportions. And they just... You know, it's a weird thing. And I think Disney is also at a point where, and I think this is one of the most fascinating things, Disney has monopolized the industry to such an extent that they are in direct competition with themselves. <laughs> yeah, and right. that is weird. Because that's the thing. Part of why Solo didn't do well is because of Infinity War. Yes. And yeah. also because of Deadpool 2, which they're about to own. Uh-huh. So, you know, and they did this not six months ago with Black Panther treading all over a wrinkle in time. And they're like, should we like separate our two movies by more than two weeks? No! Why would we need to do that? There's infinite people in the world with infinite money. Yeah. And, of course, it, and it happened again. And they're already in this debate where they have too many movies. They're not spreading them out. It's a very bizarre business strategy. But it's also like, I don't know, it kind of serves you right for being an evil monopoly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> At a certain right. point of like... like you're too big... At some point to like be able to survive in this market, it's like you know, in, when a population of deer or something like grows too large for like the food source in their their biome, it's yeah. like the fucking you either start hunting those deer more or they're just going to like all die off. Because you know what the next big release is, Sean? What? It's The Incredibles two in two weeks, and that's also a Disney movie, right. and that one's yeah. going to do big. It's going to stomp whatever light is left in Solo when it comes yeah, out. That is like, just like this, the bullet in the back of the head of yeah. fucking Solo Star Wars story, isn't it? Yeah, because Incredibles 2, you know, to be fair, there's been 14 years since the last one. They've built up the hype naturally on that yeah. one. But yeah, it's, I think it's a weird scenario. I think we've gotten a little off track from the Boba Fett thing. So let's get back to this. Sean? Yeah. Characters I would rather see a Star Wars spinoff of than Boba Fett. All of them. All of them. But let's list some of them. Okay. I would rather watch a movie about Boss Nass any day of the week. Oh, 100%. I want that. I want the Gungan movie about Boss Nass trying to be a good king. Yes. I was, if we're sticking with episode one, um, Sebulba, the asshole pod racer. Watch the shit out yeah, of that. At least he, he's got a really good name. I've always yeah. liked saying Sebulba. Yes. I don't think Salacious Crumb could carry a movie, but I think you do a little like TV show about him and all his friends, kind of in a like oh. Muppet kind of style. I'd watch that. What if it's like a like a creep show style anthology show where they like introduce like a little like short thing that's like, a, and here we go about this story and about Salacious, the bounty hunter. And Salacious the- Crumb is like the Alfred Hitchcock figure introducing yes, them. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I'd like watch. Joe Hunt yeah. yeah, that yeah, we would should be, do that. That'd be a great. They should they should just make that TV show. That's yes. a very good idea. Um, I would like a like very dramatic, soulful movie about a like band of Tuscan raiders trying to survive the waste of Tatooine. I want that, and it just ends with Anakin slaughtering them. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's that's like the post credits teaser. <laughs> teaser. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like you just see Anakin step out of like the tent and turn his lightsaber. I was like, ooh. I think we should get a Richard Attenborough narrated nature documentary about the Sarlacc pit. Okay, yeah. that would be I, the thing that kills Boba Fett. Yes, that would be more interesting than the Boba Fett movie. Yeah, that, that could also be the post credits teaser for the Boba for the Boba Fett movie. Yeah, absolutely. that movie ends with him falling into the Sarlacc pit, yeah. and then they do the Attenborough yeah. documentary. Yes, that would be good. 
I would legit, like I don't know Job of the Hut. I'm very stuck on Tatooine right now. Uh, there would be that, that. There's that guy who Obi Wan goes to visit in the diner in Episode yes, Two. Yes, um, Daxter. Yeah, yeah, Daxter. There's that movie from 1982 called Diner. It should, just like it should yeah. be a remake of that, but yes. in space with Daxter. Yes, do that. <laughs> Camino in saber darts. Yeah, yes, I'd watch the be, hell out of that. That would be very good. That would be fantastic. I mean, just like you could just make, you know, a like a Sokotano movie, which they should just do. They, they should just do that. Just an an Ahsoka Ahsoka Tano Tano movie, movie. Seriously, that movie would make all the money in the world. Yeah. Just like for so many reasons right now, that would be the movie people want. Yeah. Yeah. I've gotten so close so many times to buying the Ahsoka Tano book. <laughs> it's like, I, I, it's probably not that good. I don't yeah. know. But I watch just because it's like material that they would have adapted at the end of that show. It's like, I really like that character a lot. I mean, hell, I take the fucking Maz Kanata movie from the new okay, trilogy. Sure. She's yeah. kind of cool. She's played by Lupita Nyongo. We all love Lupita Nyongo. Do that. You yeah. can do Academy Award winner Lupita Nyongo in Maz Kanata, the movie. It yeah. would do better than Solo did, probably. Yeah. Thinking about Solo, a Star Wars story, they could make a prequel to the prequel Solo. That's L three three seven, a Star Wars story. She's Which, great. Yeah. That's that character. That droid is really fucking good. I mean, I'd actually, see that. all the characters in Solo were really great, and I wouldn't mind a sequel because I really liked them. But it's not going to happen. <laughs> oh, God, no, so, it's not going to happen. All right, let's move on with the news. We will get to yeah. Solo soon. We have yes. a lot of thoughts on it. It's a movie, but uh, other piece of movie news, Sean. Okay. This came out on Twitter earlier today. Zack Snyder. Oh, God. Zack right. Snyder said on Twitter today that the next project he is in active development on is Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead because, of course, Zack Snyder wants to do an Ayn Rand movie. This, I feel like at the moment he said he wanted to do that, there should have been a small scale supernova where he was, <laughs> where just like all of his energy in the universe collapsed on itself because he reached the peak form of himself and his yeah. potential. It's, it's. Like, it both makes so much sense if you have, like, you know, been paying attention to the politics of his movies. You know, and you really only have to see, like, any random Zack Snyder movie to get that side of it. Um, but also, I, I, I fucking read that book when I was, like, 15 or something. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I'll leave it at that. Um, but I cannot, for the life of me, imagine how the fuck Zack Snyder, like... For people who don't know, The Fountainhead is about an asshole named Howard Rourke who's a, a rapist and an architect. They don't dwell on the rape part that much. But he's an architect who thinks he's, like, so much better than everybody else. And all this, like, the book portrays this as very positive. That, like, he's this creative, industrious architect. Because, you know, architecture is the most fascinating of all creative pursuits that I love reading about. Um, he's a, no offense to architects out there. It's just not the most sexy profession in the world, right? Yeah. Um, but he, he like, thinks he knows everything about architecture and is, like, on the cutting edge fucking avant-garde buildings that, like, just look so amazing. There's a lot of descriptions of, like, very, like, modernist building architecture that this Howard Rourke dude puts together. And, and politics and the fucking critics don't get him and, like, no, your buildings suck and you have to build like everybody else builds buildings. He's like, no, I'm going to build buildings the way I think are the best. And only, like, the smartest people understand him. That's what that story is about. Which, like, again, you can see the politics association with Zack Snyder and his obsession with like Rorschach and Batman and those kinds of characters but also Howard Rourke doesn't go around and beat the shit out of people in slow motion action scenes Zack, Zack Snyder's never made a movie that didn't rely like like 30% of it is not slow motion action scenes right like that's his fucking ouvoir yes. is slow motion action scenes the movie there is not a single action scene in the movie about the asshole architect that, how does he make this movie John? to be fair there's not really any action scenes in Watchmen either and he found places to put them but but that's a superhero movie like yeah, no, there no. is space to put them like because sure. there are there is like there are fist fights in Watchmen. it's that, not they're not action scenes of the comic book that said you know i did not know the plot of the fountainhead i probably could have guessed because you just described the plot of atlas shrugged also oh except for an atlas shrugged it's railroads and not buildings yes that's but, the, that's the key difference yeah and also it's, it's about 500 pages longer and that was one i did not read to the end okay good you, no one should no they become like fucking Paul Ryan and then they ruin our country yeah so anyway um but I here's the thing though you know having been exposed to some of the toxic Zack Snyder fan community online <laughs> yeah your description of the fountainhead that is how all of them talk about Zack Snyder yes so I yes, do see how he thinks this is his story of like 
I don't do movies the way other people do movies, man. And that's why my movies are good, but you guys, you don't see. And that's why they took Justice League away from me, because it was going to be a masterpiece, but they couldn't yeah, see like, it. Where's the Snyder Cut, motherfuckers? They're, they're fucking holding it back on, like, the Howard Rourke Cut. I made three tweets about this earlier. In the two hours before we recorded this podcast, and I already had a Zack Snyder fan come after me explaining how, no, there's nothing wrong with the Watchmen adaptation because Dave Gibbons, the illustrator, said it was really good. Okay. 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 I mean, you misspelled Alan Moore there, but <clears throat> whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've, so... Yeah. One last thing to say about the Fountainhead, now that I'm, like, plumbing the depths of my memory about that book, there was one character that is the, like, foppish, like, probably, like, trying to be, like, coded as homosexual, like, in a negative way, character that is the critic, Ellsworth M. Tuhi. I like that name. And and I do not... Zack Snyder will not update that character for the 21st century. No. That would be my prediction. Fucking no. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, it sounds like a movie about abusing women... Thinking you're really great and fascism, and those are three things Zack Snyder, his yeah. movies, maybe not the per- I know nothing about the person, the movies are in fucking love with. So yeah, it it is particularly like I think is a very bold choice to to in like the Me Too moment we're having to say I'm going to make Fountainhead, which is 100 percent a book that glorifies the abusive asshole creative genius, the male creative genius of of the the central figure. It's like we're in a culture right now that is trying to sort of like dismantle that archetype and throw it in the fucking Sean, trash where it belongs. And this, you're like picking the book that below Atlas Shrugged is like the most glorifying of that figure. This is the guy, Sean, who when he had full creative carte blanche from Warner Brothers made a movie called Sucker Punch that is about <laughs> right. a bunch of young women being thrown in an asylum and to empower themselves they imagine they are in a brothel mostly naked for the pleasure of like really creepy dudes and they beat like video game characters up because... That's the only way Zack Snyder's movies can see women. Yeah, see, I've read The Fountainhead and you've seen Sucker Punch. And those are crosses that we will bear for the rest of our life. All right, moving on. So there was a big kerfuffle last week over uh, getting into video game news. PlayStation CEO John Codera said at a yeah. conference that the PS4 is nearing the end of its life cycle. Uh, but as part of a broader conversation about the console's age, future, etc., he said the focus over the next three years is on exclusive games online services, subscriptions, etc., hardware not being a focus. People spun this out in a dozen different ways. I do think there's something a little weird about talking about this right now, but either way, um, this is a case where I feel like there was a lack of like context and understanding of what these probably meant, so I thought it was worth talking about for a couple of minutes. Yeah, because it was it was like a, at a financial meeting, yeah, yeah. so it wasn't it wasn't like really designed as this like public message of like word. We're doing something new in three years. It was more talking to financial investors and everybody about we are entering what it's like. We're entering the beginning of the last stage of the PS4's life cycle. I I still think that knowing that those comments would be public to all the gaming press, I would have worded it differently. Sure. It's tone deaf in the way a lot of Sony messaging is tone deaf. But but it's like, it's also just like obviously true that like we're going to get a PS5 probably around 2020, 2021. Like that's, Yeah. Like, that's almost certainly what's going to happen. Like, I would be very shocked if that was not the plan for a while. Yeah. But because, yeah, so it it is like a weird, I agree, it was like, it was phrased a little bit strangely, which makes more sense when you understand it's like, not, like, he wasn't aiming it at consumers in any way, but he, you're right, he probably should have been sort of like, aware of that, that, you know, the gaming press. There's no such thing as a closed door meeting anymore, so, you know. Yeah. Get with the times. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. But it's, you know, like, you know, prepare, save up for something for 2020, because that is when, if there are going to be new consoles, that is probably the year they're going to come out. I guess it, I do think the timeline of new consoles that we're hearing about does confuse me on a pretty fundamental level that this generation is not going to be any longer than the previous one, because sure. that would be a, that would be actually a year shorter than the last generation if it were 2020. If it were 2021, you'd get to the same length if you consider it from the start of the 360, which was a year earlier, uh, and went to 2013, yeah. 2006 to 2005 to 2013. Which was a full, you know, eight-year cycle. This would be a seven or eight-year cycle, maybe. Yeah, which the but PS3 also, was seven years, right? Yeah. The PS3 was 2006 to 2013. Yeah. But I just, I don't, especially like, if, if Sony internally does not view this generation as being any longer than the previous gen, can we just close the book on the mid-cycle hardware refresh thing? That was a flop, right? 
I have no idea. Like, I have, like, like, no access to the sales data. I mean, like, the PS4 as a console is still wildly successful. It is wildly I, successful. I I've never seen any numbers that split out what the PS4 Pro specifically has been selling. It just, it really is interesting whenever anyone, including, like, in the business with a business strategy, tries to predict a rapid, big change to the console market, whether it's going to die or we're going to be making it, like, iPhones with, like, new hardware refreshes and all these things... It just doesn't like that. The, the main cycle of you have a hardware for a couple of years and then you replace it seems to be very difficult to break from. Yeah. Because it does feel like if any console is kind of like set up to just go for a while, it's the PS4, especially now they've got the Pro and, you know, they've got exclusives uh, all the way out for years to come. It does, and, you know, it, this generation took a while to get started too in terms right. of being revved up. I think part of why people are kind of surprised that people are talking about the end coming is that, you know, the games take so long to develop now. When you think about the major games, like, there have been many, many fewer, you know, of those. Like, like Naughty Dog had four games on the PS3. They've had one. Well, I guess two with Uncharted The Lost Legacy right. so far now. So yeah. it's like, when you look put it in those terms, like, it does feel like this generation isn't at the same point like the last generation was five years in, you know? Sure. And, yeah. and so I just... I don't know. I, it is a weird thing to be contemplating. Um, but I get it, obviously. The hardware yeah. is old. And the weird thing about these mid-console refreshes of the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One X and stuff is that they still have to support everything of the previous one. So if the launch PS4 is getting old, the PS4 Pro does nothing to ameliorate yeah. that for the vast majority of users. I mean, all this does for me is like further cement me in the position I always had about these fucking mid-console refreshes that everybody's always... Because it has brought the people out of the woodwork again. They're being like, oh, but no, it's going to be like a PS4 Pro 2. That's going to... It's like, no, that's not what the... Fu because the PS4 Pro and Xbox One X only happened because 4K TVs happened. If, yes. that, if 4K TVs did not happen, we never would have gotten the fucking mid-console refresh thing. That's, no, that's the totally only true. reason it fucking happened. So it's like, I don't think it would happen again because unless there's another like 8K or some bullshit that like happens again in the middle of a console generation, I don't think it would happen again because there's no reason for it to. There's no yeah. like good reason for the PS4 Pro to exist other than for it to support this new display technology that was like became more readily available. I mean, there will be new display technology within the next generation. There just will be. The, the, sure. the way the TV market is going, they're all insane and they're trying to sell TVs the way we sell iPhones now. And I don't think it's going to work long term, yeah. but it's the business model they're in. I think that the next generation hardware manufacturers are going to have to hold the line and remember that that does not matter to consumers because after they put out the Pro and the Xbox One X, the Nintendo Switch came out with its little 1080p right. and kicked all their asses. So like... That's not something consumers care about, and they, they honestly they probably would have been better off holding the line with just keep your Xbox One and keep your PS4, and we'll have 4K on the PS5 because that would be a bigger selling point yeah. then than now. But yeah, it is. Uh, this generation has been a little confusing in terms of life cycle and all of that because of that whole thing. But no, you're totally right. There's nothing really controversial about what he said. It makes yeah. sense. Um, but I just thought it would be worth talking about. Yeah. It is something that I'll be curious to see if once we get closer, because I agree, like, it does, like, in my heart of hearts, it feels soon, but also it feels soon because it's, like, two to three years away. So yeah. it's, like, it, I think, like, by the time it, we get there, like, who knows how we will feel. It, it kind of reminds me of, like, the, the Peter Capaldi leaving, and when it was, like, you only had two seasons, it's like, no, what? That's insane. But then when you get into the third season, it's like, okay, I can see yeah. I can see the path of how we have come here. What if what if they do the PS5 and once again have no backwards compatibility? That would be an issue. I think they will have to be backwards compatible with the PS4. Like it's just you say that I would have thought that about a lot of things with Sony. This, I don't know, but like I think there's just like there's no unless there's like they make some weird like left turn technology wise it would just be pretty relatively speaking easy for it to be backwards compatible with the PS4 you would have said that after the PS2 going into the PS3 and they did the weird hard left turn yeah, technology wise but like that's the one time they did it and they got bit in the ass by it and there's no yeah. there's no reason to do the cell thing anymore like nobody like the cell processor thing that they did with the PS3 yeah. like nobody's trying to do that like no I agree like with this hardware thing I do think there needs to be a fundamental shift in the console market in so much as there needs to be more continuity between consoles yeah. Of like your PS, if you buy a PS5, it should not fundamentally change how you interface with your PS4 software. I just think that, and same with Xbox. What the Xbox Two should be the same with the Xbox One. Yeah, and I, Microsoft is clearly on that boat with all their backwards compatibility stuff. 
it, like, because that is the way I think consumers understand technology now, that you don't buy an iPhone 8 and all your iPhone 7 apps stop working. That'd be yeah. fucking bizarre. And it would be bizarre for the PS5 to do that. You know, yeah. Sony does have a history of getting too big for their britches and thinking they're, you know, immune from these things. So it wouldn't be yeah. out of the realm of possibility. It's, it's Yeah, it is within the realm of possibility, but... Like it, but there is also like because it is a technologically motivated issue, right? Yeah. Like it is if if it was something that you could just do for free, and it's like was like in backwards compatibility was just super easy to do, everybody would be fucking doing it, right? It would be, you know, there was the whole the PS3 did launch with that PS2 compatibility, it had the chip yeah, in and there. they fucking lost a shit it's ton of money, money doing that, yeah. right? Because they had to basically put a PS2 inside of every PS3. True. The upside of that when they pulled it out was they also got to start selling you PS2 games again. Sure. So yes, yeah. You know, let's not pretend there's there's not multiple avenues they're coming from on this stuff. Yeah. So anyway, uh, let's move on. Uh, one other piece of video game news that the hardware issue I think is interesting is Nintendo is now selling a cheaper Nintendo Switch bundle in Japan. Right. It's about $50 less that only has the system and the Joy-Cons. It has no dock, which is how it was usually reported on. But notably, it also has no AC adapter. <laughs> which <laughs> is... fuckers. Which is... What is Nintendo... Like, Nintendo has learned so many lessons and stubbornly not learned some others. And it is very strange because they started doing this with the 3DS near the end of its... Not even near, near the end. By I think it was the XL all over the world except the US didn't ship with it. And then the new 3DS everywhere in the world didn't ship with it. And now they're doing it with this... Because here's the thing. If it were without the dock and without all the, the home stuff, that actually would make total sense to start yeah. selling a cheaper Switch for just portable use, especially in Japan. Absolutely. But also, I think over here, there would be a market for that. And if you wanted to add the dock later, you could. But I think that would move it that way. But here's the thing. If you were to buy this bundle, you need a way to charge your Switch. If you bought the official AC adapter, it would bring the price roughly back to just uh-huh. the normal version where you would also get a dock. Motherfuckers! What like, is going on? That is such I, a weird decision. Yeah, I just I feel like if you know we if like Dante Alighieri was alive today and he wrote like a modern version of the Divine Comedy, there would be a like special circle of hell that is just tech manufacturers that don't put in all the requisite cables and pack them in with their products. It's like it's such the like the fucking most dick thing you could possibly I do. Mean, I have no tolerance for it at all. I mean if this were the Switch XL or something they were doing. Sure. If it was a hardware I, refresh, it's still it would still be a bad. fucking piece of shit move. Especially if it's a proprietary like AC yes. adapter and it was not something that like I have like a million micro USB cables or something. I mean the cable is it's USB C, it's very easy to get. But uh, like the Switch needs a certain amount of power output and like your iPhone charger won't do it so like that's why you need the the Nintendo power adapter yeah but what I was saying is that that would be bad business practice but it would at least be within the realm of like understandable corporate sense because they've done it before and the idea being that and this you know this was true when I upgraded my 3DS I already had an AC adapter it made it hard when I went to resell the goddamn thing but whatever um there's like no logic for this. Like one person said, well, maybe it's for people who want multiple switches in one house. But like, this still doesn't make sense. You still, if you have two switches, you need two chargers. Yeah. If I, if I, I don't know. If you wouldn't have if everyone in your house used Apple laptops. You wouldn't have one charger that the family used. <laughs> Gather around the fire, kids. We're gonna charge our i, you know, our iPads. Mom, Big Sis won't lend me her charger. Yeah, I. That doesn't happen because. They sell the charger with the computer. Yeah. It's, it's a it's very bizarre business. Madness. Because, again, the idea of, like, moving to sell the Switch also as just a portable, I think is actually a cool idea and yeah. something that is probably worth Nintendo exploring because clearly the market exists for both sides of the portable home equation. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be the success it is. But that is such a weird way to do it. And maybe Japan stands for it. Like, I have to imagine that's a larger corporate strategy in Japan for Nintendo to be doing it. You but I don't hope. know. Yeah. Who knows? I, I don't know enough about, like, Japanese electronics. I'll have to jump on Japanese Google later yeah. and, and, and like solve the, this issue. Does Apple just sell the iPhone in Japan without any cables? Yeah. It'd be very weird. It's just, it's just such a fucking... It's, it's not a big issue. It's just such an asshole move. It it's, really... It's just one of those things it that's is. like, it's not a big problem, but it just pisses me off. Yeah. All right. Uh, if you know if you're in Japan, they're not getting rid of the original version of the Switch. Just buy that. Yeah, just buy that one. Suspend your five thousand yen. You're fine. Yeah. You, you know, whatever. All right. Uh, speaking of Japan, Yakuza three, four, and five yes. are all being remastered and re-released for the PlayStation four in Japan. They heard our prayers. They are coming between this summer and next spring. All upgraded to 1080p 
and 60 FPS. This means the entire saga will be playable on the PlayStation 4. Mm -hmm. No word of a Western release, but clearly given the recent success of this series over here, they will be coming. And Sean, you will be able to play Yakuza 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 on your PlayStation 4. I thought this would make you happy. Are you happy? So it was, it was, because I, I think I saw that like around the time it was announced, I was like, was about to go to bed and saw it on Twitter. And it was just like, I had, I had pleasant dreams that night. <laughs> it was just like, pleasant but, dreams of like cutting people's fingers off? Yeah, no, no, like helping people, you know, bringing people pizzas in their time of need when they're actually looking for working visas. And, yes. you know, and dancing mini games and playing billiards with my fucking shirtless Yakuza bros. That's, that's the, the, the fantasy world. And yes, you know, there's sometimes I gotta rip off my shirt and go, yeah, and punch somebody in the face. That was there too, but that was also fun. Yes. Um, yeah, it's just, just like, there is like this weird, like like little tiny deep in my stomach, this little tiny stress knot, just like a little tiny stress knot that just completely came undone. It's like, oh, yes, I could just because it was something of like there's I've been having this like running thing in my head of like, hmm, do I could I just maybe I want to just buy a PS3 that's super cheap or I could borrow it from somebody and play and like get all those other games. It's just like hmm, they're like trying to figure out that situation. It's like nope, it's that problem is solved. They're just putting them out. And for you, Sean, even if they don't do a Western release, you could just get them in Japanese. Exactly, yeah, which I plan to do on, because there's the Yakuza Ishin game, which is a spin-off set during the Meiji era that came out with the launch of the PS4 in Japan that they never localized, which I will do that someday. I will play that game in All right. Japanese. But You've yes. got a lot of Yakuza to enjoy. I have so much Yakuza, because Kiwami 2 is coming out over here in, like, December, so. I look forward to, I hope they do this, a just a nice box set of all seven Yakuza games. Fuck. Kind of like when you get, like, the Kinji Fukasaku Yakuza series, Battles Without Honors and Humanity. Yeah. Like, it's a DVD set, and you got all these Yakuza movies. They need to do that with the Yakuza games, and just be like, here's 700 hours of Yakuza. Yeah. And it's just like, all right, I'm in. The seven discs, seven games, a lot of beaten up, a lot of Games to play? Yes, there's a lot of lot of silly mini games. A lot of karaoke to do. So many karaoke songs, and they're so good. Yeah, yeah. I'm very excited. I'm I'm just I'm happy that they're doing it, and I feel I feel glad that I didn't like buy and try to play Yakuza Six, knowing now that's like okay, the whole I will be able to play the series in order in a very easy way, and I don't yes. have to like kind of read a bunch of Wikipedia summaries or something and play the most recent game. Awesome. Yeah. This is a very smart thing. I'm glad they're doing it. Yes. All right. Uh, Finally, some TV news. Two pieces of TV news. Right. First, we had previously reported... Uh, we previously reported. We previously talked yeah, we about the reports. Broke the story, I think you mean. <laughs> no. That uh, Damon Lindelof, uh, the creator of Lost and The Leftovers, was developing a Watchmen adaptation for HBO that was going to be a pilot at first, and then you know, they ordered the series from that. Well, this week, Damon Lindelof published on Instagram a really cool five-page letter about his vision for the Watchmen TV series at HBO. Did you see this, Sean? No, uh, I didn't read it. I, I saw it's, that it came out. It's very cool. He talked about his father, who he got his love of comics from, and kind of the course of his life learning about comics from his dad, and his dad's favorite comic being Watchmen, and that being passed to him. He talked about uh, how many times he was asked by people at this company to do Watchmen and had turned it down over and over until finally they kind of wore him down. Um, and he also talked about his vision for the series and how he envisions it as a remix where he says the original comics will be like the Old Testament of the series. They happened, they are canon, they are important, but that is not what the series is. It is not an adaptation of Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons' Watchmen, mm -hmm. which is probably the right decision. Yeah. Um, the next day, Damon Lindelof confirmed six cast members for the pilot, and this is a hell of a cast. It is going to be led by Regina King, who is a great actress. She was on The Leftovers. She was on American Crime. She's really, really a great actress. Uh, Don Johnson, the star of Miami Vice, is going to be on it. Tim Blake Nelson, who you've seen in all sorts of things, like uh, I always think of him from Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Uh, Adelaide Clemens, who was in this acclaimed show Rectify, a guy named Andrew Howard. And Louis Gossett Jr., who's a pretty famous guy. He's got two Academy Awards. He was in Roots, all these things. Really amazing cast. Yeah. Uh, Angela King will be playing, or sorry, Angela King. Regina King will be playing a cop named Angela Abraham, while Gossett Jr. is playing an androgynous police officer named Pirate Jenny. Uh, and yeah. Howard is a cop named Red Scare, who's apparently Russian. They also announced that Nicole Castle, who directed two episodes of The Leftovers, she did two of the three Reverend Matt episodes, the Chris Eccleston episodes, which means she did two of the series' very, very best episodes, will be helming the pilot. Um... Obviously, we both said this, a Watchmen TV, or TV series is in and of itself a stupid idea. Oh, yes. Yeah. But you put that many talented people in a room, 
and have them make a Watchmen TV series, this is now something I'm actually pretty excited for because that is too much talent to go to waste. That is a really, really impressive lineup of ideas and people. I'm vocal. David Lindelof is one of my favorite people in television. But um, hearing him talk about it, seeing this cast, seeing who they've got to direct the pilot, I'm really interested in their idea for this. Yeah, it sounds like a lot more interesting than what the, like, the the like immediate assumption of Watchmen like TV miniseries kind of thing immediately goes to like a fuck off like don't make that them saying like no we're going to try to like take it in a different direction and do new material that is the right choice yes like, yeah otherwise Ob- it would be boring obviously I would be more excited if they were just making an original thing with their own characters yeah. but you know you got to pay the bills the the right. IP draws eyes in that's what gets HBO interested it in, you know. And I'm curious to see what they do with it. Yes. You know, Lost was also something that Damon Lindelof... Damon Lindelof did not like create Lost on the ground floor. It was an ABC executive who had the idea for a TV version of Castaway, the Tom Hanks movie, which was a terrible idea. And then Damon Lindelof came in and made it something. So, you know, these things happen sometimes. You're yeah. handed lemons, you make lemonades out of it. I think this could be interested or could be interesting. And I just like some of the transparency about it, too, of him getting yeah. ahead of the this is a bad idea and being like, I know it's a bad idea, but hear me out. Yeah. It's, it's a very smart move of, yeah. Like, is it like sort of like pulling back the curtain being like, look, let's fucking talk guys. Yeah. Like, it's is a stupid, like I'd like, that's something that Amazon has to do with their fucking Lord of the Rings thing. They're making. It's they like, really need to do someone that. Someone has to sit down and be like, look guys, we get it. Well, you know what they need to Here's do with their Lord of the Rings thing. They need to hire a writer because they still haven't <laughs> right, done that. Yes, yeah. That would be maybe step one. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, I do look forward to the five season adaptation of the Silmarillion. Word for, word for word, it'll be very faithful. Each word gets its own episode, actually. Each word gets its own episode. That's going to yeah. be crazy. It's, it's, it will be one of the longest-running TV show series in American history. One of the episodes will be a live reading of The Legend of Sigurd and Gudrun. I, we can only hope so. You know, it, it's, it's not in the Lord of the Rings universe, but having not read it, it honestly might as well be. <laughs> yes. All right, finally, we have a piece of Doctor Who news. This is sort of around the periphery, but something I wanted to talk about because we love Doctor Who, and this is just a cool story. Uh, A man by the name of Graham Strong died this week at the age of 69, and he is important to Doctor Who history because this is the guy from whom many of the high-quality audio recordings of classic Doctor Who exists. He was an electronics student at the time that Doctor Who premiered, and he first used what was a second-hand reel-to-reel tape machine with a mic to record audio from the TV. But starting around the time of the serial The Daleks Master Plan... Yeah, which is like season three of Doctor Who. Yeah, and I'm, I'm reading, by the way, from a... Uh, I'm quoting from a Doctor Who news article here. He used his electronics knowledge to wire the audio output from the television into the tape recorder, which at the time was a highly dangerous procedure <laughs> that right. broke every rule of electrical safety... But it recorded, resulted in recordings that were crystal clear. There were several fans who recorded audio every week. Like, we have lots of tapes. But Graham Strong is believed to be the only one to record it directly from the television, resulting in the superior quality of his recordings. In 1994, uh, he met a Doctor Who fan who had contacts in the BBC, and that brought his collection to the attention of the BBC. By the time the master tapes of most, by that time, those master tapes of those early episodes had been junked. So this is when most of Doctor Who is missing, or the the first two Doctors is missing, and they're looking for episodes and stuff. Um, <clears throat> but there's a lot of things missing, and so after uh, Strong was reassured that his tapes would be carefully cared for, he handed over his recordings. There were over 100 Doctor Who episodes he had recorded. And those have been used for the animated releases of missing episodes, such as Power of the Daleks from a couple years ago, the first Patrick Troughton story. And his recordings are so clear that they often exceed the quality available on the film prints that survive. And as a result, a lot of the DVDs of those early episodes just use the Graham Strong recordings rather than the actual archival film print stuff. So if you like classic Doctor Who, you have heard Graham Strong's work recording this stuff. And he is one of those crazy Doctor Who fans without whom a lot of the series would not exist in the quality we have it. And yeah. that's so cool. Yes, it is. it's one of the things that makes the Doctor Who sort of like fan community one of the best, I think, around. Particularly like the classic Doctor Who guys, like just like that group of particularly like Graham Strong that were around during that day and like... Have made it made it their like life's mission in a weird way to be like we're gonna fucking fit like a horrible crime to like the culture history was made by the BBC not just for Doctor Who but lots of TV shows um, that they made in that period and and 
these people like have done so much to help fix that, and it's such a service to like archival and, and history and and yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. And, and so you know, thoughts and everything out to his family. But like, what an amazing guy! Tip of the hat from two Doctor Who fans to another Doctor Who, a Doctor Who super fan. Yes. To just you know, because we have heard his work very yeah, literally no, in our yeah. ears, and that is awesome. Yeah, it is. So it's, yeah. Yep. Amazing. All right. Very cool. Let's move on, Sean, to our main topic of the day, which is Solo, a Star Wars story. There you got it right that time. Yes. Uh, spoilers for anyone who hasn't seen it, coming soon. <clears throat> I want to start here, Sean. Okay. I said on the podcast, I think two weeks ago when we talked about, we're doing that series where we talk about all of the original Star Wars movies. Yes. And I say original, now you can just lump the prequels into that, which is nice. <laughs> right, Because yes. it's just, those are the George Lucas Star Wars movies and you put them off to the side. Because again, if that Boba Fett movie is the movie they make after episode nine, that will be the movie that is the sixth Disney era <laughs> Star Wars movie. And isn't that a frightening thought? Anyway, um, when we were talking about Star Wars A New Hope, the original Star Wars, I said... Looking at Harrison Ford's work in that movie, the biggest challenge to the makers of Solo, this prequel, would be to thread this really precise needle between, you know, Han Solo at the beginning of Star Wars is this jaded guy who, you know, just shoots Greedo and he doesn't really want friends. You know, he has Chewbacca, but he's very, you know, dis disillusioned with the world. But he has this arc of coming around to, you know, helping out Luke. And I said, it's going to be hard to tell a meaningful story with that guy and leave him in a place where we feel like he could become that character there. And the thing that I think I am most impressed with Solo, a Star Wars story with, is that I think they thread that needle about as well as you could in a movie like this. Because I think uh, Jonathan and Lawrence Kasdan, the guys who wrote the movie, Lawrence Kasdan, of course, Star Wars royalty, he wrote yeah. Empire Strikes Back. He knows Han Solo better than just about anyone, other than maybe Harrison Ford, um, and you know, came back to write this film. And I think what they did in the script, and particularly what Alden Elrenreich does with the character, which I think is really good work, is that they try to they go in a different direction than I was expecting. They don't just make him Han Solo the legend in a movie. He's a plucky kid who's an idealist who wants something out of life and who thinks he has to adopt this persona of Han Solo of the, you know, cool rogue anti-hero who's like cooler than everyone else and doesn't care. But ultimately what the movie is about is something that is true to who Han Solo is in the original movies is that he may present that to all of us, but he is a good guy deep down. And he can fight that, but like part of his arc in The Empire Strikes Back, as it is in A New Hope, is he is trying to be the guy who just doesn't care about anything and runs away from a fight, but he never is that when the chips come down. And I do think there are a lot of messy things to solo a Star Wars story, but I thought in Aaron Reich's performance, and I think in the script, in its broad strokes, and in some particular moments... I thought they told that particular story in a way that gave me some kind of concentrated insight onto Han Solo I thought I didn't have before. And that is the thing I like more than anything else maybe about the movie. Yeah, I, I mostly agree with that. I think for me there is a, there's a certain inescapable quality to the movie of that like... it. I think like there's so much stuff that is really well done about it. And particularly I think Act 2 is just fantastic in this movie. Everything so of like going to Kessel, everything on Kessel, and leaving Kessel. That stretch of the movie is so fucking good. But still, it just feels like there is no need for this movie to exist. Which is a hard problem for a story to escape from. And it's one of the things of where... I, one of the reasons why I said at the top of this podcast of like... Like this, just like there's just a certain dullness to this movie that, that I can't get away from. That if it had not been a Star Wars movie, I think I would have enjoyed it a lot more. If I didn't have to sit there and like, and the movie is constantly reminding you that he's Han Solo because they basically do this weird thing of pack every single detail we ever learned about Han Solo's past in uh, New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. All of them happen in this movie. The the best thing I've seen written about this movie. This was the film critic Drew McWeeny. Um, positive review, but I think he described this correctly, which was Solo is the feature-length version of that 10-minute scene at the beginning of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, yes. where River Phoenix plays young Indiana Jones, and everything important we know about Indiana Jones happens in one afternoon. Yeah. It's not as whiplashy in Solo because it is years of his life portrayed. But it is still like, yes, by the end of this movie, just about everything important about Han Solo is put into action, at least, in this film. Yeah, and so there's just something about, like, if this had been... He's obviously, like, I think they do a good job of, like you're saying, sort of exploring the essence of the Han Solo character. 
but at the same time, like, there's only so much you can do. It's like, there's only so much you can do when it's not Harrison Ford playing the role. Because it's like, I think Alden Ehrenreich did a fucking amazing job. As good as anybody could possibly do, but you still can't... I Like, I left the movie feeling like you still can't do it. Like, if they couldn't do it to, at least to me... Like, in my, like, sort of subjective impression of the movie, if they couldn't do it for me in this movie, they would never have been able to, like, there's no possible way to do it. Harrison Ford, that that performance and what Harrison Ford does is too distinct and specific that, like, you just can't quite capture it. And you, there's, like, there's no, I still feel like there was no real story to be told in the history of that character like this. And so it was a bit easier for me to enjoy the movie in, like, that middle stretch when the action was going. When I kind of was able to kind of forget about the Han Solo-ness of it. It was, like, just get into the flow of the adventure. And once I got into that, I was really enjoying it. And then once you get into the third act, they, like, start, like, throwing Han Solo references at you again. It's like, no, I don't, like, why does this have to be a Star Wars movie was kind of the feeling I had. I do think the script needed more passes. I mean, I will say that that's the first thing. And... You know, I think the Kasdans, clearly, if you read all the behind-the-scenes stuff, were very holier than thou about the sanctity of their script. And that is part of why Miller and Lord got canned. And I'll just say a brief thing on the... I don't know how much I even want to say about the directorial shift and stuff. Yeah, it's because hard to talk about. It doesn't... You don't really feel it in the movie, I don't I think. But I do think... One thought I had is that if this movie is representative of the script they had that they gave to Lord and Miller, they were fucking insane to hire Phil Lord and Chris Miller because this isn't a comedy. This isn't yes, one yeah. of their movies. Like, this is... That is bizarre. It is just the world's weirdest directorial choice if this movie is representative of that script. Yeah, because honestly, it has less humor in it than Episode 7 and Episode 8, which are yeah. not like, you know, these, like, big fucking, like, laugh-off movies, but they have jokes in them. Yeah. This movie has... It has a couple of jokes... But not many. Yeah. It's a pretty grimy I, movie. I think it's. I think like characters are funny as characters. Like Alden Ehrenreich is charming and fun to watch. Yeah. You know Donald Glover is charming and fun to watch. But it's not like they're making jokes. Yeah. And you know I don't doubt that Phil Lord and Chris Miller could have done something with it. But you combine that with that this is a big technical production that a lot of the stuff we've learned in recent weeks from some of the the interview pieces sounds like. It was more than just Kathleen Kennedy upset. I think a lot of people were not happy with their work, and I think they probably were not ready for a movie this big, which happens, you know? Right. Uh, you might want to figure that out before you start shooting, but whatever. Again, franchise has been mismanaged, <laughs> obviously. Yes. When you have to reshoot a movie three-fourths of the way through, someone's mismanaged yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, the, the point going back to the script is I do think it's a good... I think there's a lot of good scripting in it, Sure, I think yes, there yeah. is like there are there are clunkers and we'll get to those. There are also really good inspired lines and good inspired characters and characterizations and you know like the whole way they like incorporate the castle run into this thing. I thought that sounded stupid. It works in the movie. Like it's yeah. a, it's a it's a story it, that they it works build out. until somebody says you know we or I think Han Solo just sort of says oh, we just made the castle run in twelve parsecs. It's like fuck. Don't say that line. Yeah. Don't stop. Don't say that. Like, it's anyway, fine when it yeah. just is the Kessel Run. When but you I, have to fucking draw attention to it, it sucks. Yeah. But I do think, like, this is a script that needed maybe another year to bake. When mm-hmm. you look at, like... It is a it is a three-act movie that is divisible because it's literally three movies. Like, it <laughs> yes, is literally... Yes, 100%. It, and, and, like... I, and I like every moment of it. Like, it is... Not every moment. But, you know, what I mean is, like, moment to moment, the movie is fun. I don't think there's, like, horrible scenes in it. There might be bad lines or something. It it moves fine. It looks very good. We'll talk about... I love the cinematography. We'll get into all of that. But, like, the, the amount of shoe leather needed to get them just to his, like, meeting with Beckett, the, the Woody Harrelson character... Yes. Is Tobias a, Beckett. Tobias Beckett. That's a lot of shoe leather. To get from that to the Kessel Run stuff is a lot more, and then to get to the full final act of the movie, which is all shoe leather all the time, yeah. is like, who boy, like, I think there is a really great character arc in this, I think there's great character relationships, I think there's good world building, genuinely, yes. because I think this movie actually delivers the promise that, like, Rogue One didn't do, of taking us to places from that original trilogy milieu we did not see, and I think sure. it does that well. But I do think the script needed, like, like, and this is one of the things that when you first start writing something, that those connective tissue points are the hardest things to iron out. And I think the most important core things are there, but there is a lot of, like, this movie feels longer than it's two hours. Yeah, I think there is a version of this movie where about the first 15 to 20 minutes are cut. Just, yeah. like, totally. And it's like, and there, I, there's a lot of stuff I like in that. Like, I particularly... You know, and actually, maybe I would kind of start it with like the Star Wars World War One stuff. Is maybe mm-hmm. where there's like 
because you know the the backstory with Kira is technically important to the story, but you can get what you need from that. From, like, lines that they talk about. And I think that actually would have been better to have, like, a certain mystique to that character. Because there was, it was just, it was, like, a sort of thought experiment I was having when the third act was getting very messy and kind of slow and boring to me. It was like, where, do, like, you know, it's it's like creative writing class 101. Like, the first week of creating writing class is like, where do you start your story? Like, that's the most important thing. And, it, and writing stories oftentimes is a lot like writing essays. You usually write the beginning. And then you write the rest of it, and then you cut the beginning out, and then you go. And it's yes. like that's it says it's because it's like everything you wrote at the very beginning is actually not necessary at all, and it's just you figuring out what's happening. It's important to your creative process, exactly. Like I completely buy that the Kasdans would say, "Well, like, we needed to write that to get to know where Han's headspace is." For the, of course, totally get that. That's backstory creation. Yeah, but is it what this movie is? Yeah, because you can, and they do actually like intimate everything. Like that scene where Han and Chewie and everyone they're like with like the new gang. He's just found yeah. um, are sitting around in like the like basically the campfire on this icy planet before they do their big heist job, and they're talking about what does everybody want, and then Han is talking about like well there's this girl and like that scene that's all you needed you didn't need to show yes. him on Corellia and running away with like you didn't need to do any of that stuff that scene tells you everything you need to know about his backstory and then when he meets the character that's like Kira that's when like the rest of that fills in and you've done the work like you've done all the work the audience needs because here's one of the issues that comes up from this like I do like the Corellia scenes I think they're enjoyable yeah. I, I like I, assume, I don't know what is and isn't Ron Howard's I'm just going to refer to it all as Ron Howard's yeah. but I like the way Ron Howard stages the, the big confrontation with the evil worm lady yes it like looks in mother it looks very 80s jim henson like labyrinth or the dark crystal and i approve yes i love the look of it i hadn't quite thought of that but that is 100 what it feels and like. Corellia is one of those places that again feels like a piece of world building that this is a genuine like part of star wars cd underbelly we haven't been to and it's a cool like i think all the production design in this movie is outstanding yeah i think it's probably my favorite part of the movie is yeah. just yeah the world building and the sets and the, the sense of place that it communicates and the way bradford young shoots them oh yeah. I, I love Bradford Young so much. He's so great. Anyway, we'll get to that later. But I think you're right because what that those 15 minutes set up is a motivation that Han has been separated from his girlfriend, his, his love since childhood, and needs to get back to her. That is not his motivation in this movie. No, yeah. But it creates it in those first 15 minutes. And so for the next 15 minutes, that's his motivation. But once you get through that train job and everything, and he goes back, he meets Kira very randomly... Now, if we did not know Kira before, we wouldn't think of that as random. We would think of that as he ran into someone he knew before, and you wouldn't have any context for how kind of crazy that is that that happened. Yes, in this wide what open a, galaxy, he just happened to run into this one girl. The person who, for now, that is his sole motivation is he needs to yeah. get back to Kira. And so it kneecaps that motivation, and his motivation has to change. And I think they do a decent job of, like, over the course of the movie, keeping a good center on, like, what he's trying to get out of things personally, but it does make that weird shift of like, well, what's he in this for now? And it's, so it's very strange. But yes, if you cut it out and you started with him in the Imperial Forces and like him meeting Beckett, that probably is the more natural intro to this movie. And it would just make all the Kira scenes probably play better, you know? Yeah. So I think you're right. And it is one of those issues where, you know, and I've said this about all the Star Wars movies. They all have had scripts that needed to bake longer. Because mm -hmm. when you make four movies in four years, that happens. And I think The Last Jedi is a fantastic movie. You know, I think it's a great Star Wars film and it's one of the best. It also has a script that probably needed another month or two of baking. Of just like, oh, yeah. let's condense this, figure this. I don't think it's a ton, but it's just little connective tissue pieces. This one has a lot of those. Rogue One is... A first draft that kind of got shat out. I it's, don't know. It's like three first drafts by different writers, like stapled together. Is what it feels yeah. like. Yeah, you know, the Force Awakens like has an issue where it doesn't do enough to connect the motivation of the first half with the second half. These are all, none of these are like fundamental structural flaws that you can't fix. That's what tell. What that's what I mean when like you need to bake it longer. Yeah. It's not that the ingredients aren't there. I think the ingredients are there in all these movies. It's how much time are you putting to getting them ready to go shoot? Yeah. And you need time, you know. George mm -hmm. Lucas did not make episodes four, five, and six in two years. Right, yeah. You know, he spent three years in between each one and figured out the story. And even then, episode six didn't quite figure out the story. It's okay. <laughs> right, yeah. You know. Well, if, if David Lynch had made it like, he, like George Lucas originally wanted, it would have all been fine. Because the Ewoks would have meant something totally different. What, 100%. Yes. The yeah. Ewoks would have been dancing. 
<laughs> and there would have been a smooth jazz. Would have been just speaking backwards, it would have been great. The end of the movie would be Mark Hamill waking up in the red room and an Ewok dances toward him. Yes, and, and then just like Leia like screams this deafening pitch, high pitched scream, and then lips cuts the black. It's like ah, this is the most frightening Star Wars movie I've ever seen. Truly is one of the great missed opportunities of film history. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, but back yeah, to this movie. back to this movie. So there's that scripting problem. I do think like once the plot really gets underway, which is like 45 minutes into the movie, yeah. it's pretty smooth sailing until you hit the part where I thought the movie was over and there was a whole other act left to go. Oh, yeah, yeah. Once you get to whatever the planet is, I forgot the name, yeah. where they they deliver the Quaxium. Yeah. Which is, apparently, I I have never heard. I don't know if they made that up for this movie or this some like weird expanded universe thing I never touched. I just always heard it as hyperspace fuel, and that was yeah. it. apparently it is Quaxium. And again, even in that stretch, I think there's a lot of good ideas and ways I can see it all coming together. And it's just, there's also like some of the ways they stage it. There's, you get to that planet at the end and they're offloading all the coaxium. There's a nice little scene between him and Lando I found very funny. Yes. The last scene, there one callback I did think was genuinely funny was, I hate you, I know. Mm -hmm. Just because it's also Alden puts his arm around Donald Glover and the way he's, it's very funny. It's, yeah. it's well played. They have a good chemistry. Um... But all that happens, and then the people who have been following Beckett the whole movie the show marauders. up, and the one pulls her mask off, and it does this big shot <laughs> around her. And I, th oh, oh, it's someone we know. Do we know? Do we? Is that the Tandy Newton character? No, like twenty years younger. Who? Who? Yeah. And and they play the whole scene like we're supposed to know who she is. Yeah, and it, it's like four fucking minutes. It's just this very slow, and it, it's one of those things that where it just feels like. There is this horrible, like, misunderstanding of what the cinematic language was communicating in that scene. And it's one of those things that, like, it makes you very readily aware of, like, cinematic language is a real thing. That, like, the visuals and yes. how editing and camera movements communicate stuff to you. Like, that is a language you have learned through movies and probably, like, like naturally through, like, human instinct. Like, that is, it is communicating this information to you. I have 100% with you. It's like, what the fuck are they trying to tell me with this? Because it's like, and like the only conclusion I can come to is you're supposed to be like utterly shocked and horrified at how young she is. It's but like she's the, not that young. Like yeah, she looks like she looks like she's about Han's age or maybe a little bit younger. So there's not like yeah, there's not this like big yeah. sort of shock or like oh I know who that is or I can't believe it's this person. That is, is if, it were, if it were supposed to be like two children standing on each other's shoulders and that's what they are, <laughs> yeah, that would be surprising. Or be it's stupid. like she takes the helmet off and there's nothing underneath. And it's like. <gasps> But, you know, they, or or if it's the Thandie Newton character, which is what it should have been, it's the only thing that would have made sense. It would have made so much sense with the themes of the movie because, like, the end of the movie is going on and on about how, like, never trust anybody. is like you could be betrayed at any moment and, like, nobody has betrayed anybody up to this point in the movie. Like, that's never happened. Like, and this dude, fucking Toby Beckett, the most Star Wars named character ever, Toby Beckett. I mean, they call him Tobias. His name is Toby. Like, Toby Beckett. I don't know why they did give him a Star Wars name. They just gave him a normal human Earth person name. It was very distracting for me, that part. But he's never... We've never seen him be betrayed by anybody. We've never seen why he shouldn't trust anybody. There's, like, this hole in the movie that could have been easily filled by that Thandie Newton character popping up and be like, actually, I was working with these people for, like, the good of the galaxy all along, and I couldn't talk to you about it for whatever reason, and he feels betrayed. Like, how did that not happen? I just don't understand how, like, what the fuck happened in the third act. And we haven't even gotten to the Mr. Darth Maul yet. And okay, that was, we'll, yeah. we'll get there. But, there, like, the, this third act, the third act of this movie is so fucking confusing to me. Yeah. Just in terms of, like, how it got made. We'll, we'll get to all of the, some of these particulars. Let's talk about what is good and what we like okay. and some of yes. the broad things. Because, again, like, I think this is a movie that clearly was... Rushed out the door as fast as humanly possible. Well, yeah, I mean, Ron Howard basically had to make the movie like he had less than make a year. the movie, yeah, in like six months or something. Yeah, he had less. Literally, the firing was less than a year ago. So, like, heroic work from Ron Howard. It's a well directed movie. Like, there's yes. no. It should be way more of a disaster. It's like it's not a disaster. It's no. like a flawed movie. Yeah, but let's talk about what we like. Um, okay. The the number one thing this movie has a great cast. All okay, yeah, all yeah. the new Star Wars movies has or have. But this one is is just kind of particularly the bench is very deep in this one. Mm -hmm. um, I think let's start with Mr. Alden Ehrenreich. Yeah, there's obviously the unavoidable thing that he is not Harrison Ford. But here's what I do like: he does not try to imitate Harrison Ford in any yeah. way, while also trying. What I think he does, and I think again, I think the script does this. I think it's smart. 
Is he cues in on something from the Ford performance to bring out interpretively? What he is, he's the twinkle in Harrison Ford's eyes. He sure. is the he is playing the like you know, f- more kind of fun-loving, idealistic part of Han Solo, the guy who kind of gets off on the action and likes being out there and being the swashbuckler, but has kind of been beaten down by life when we meet him in A New Hope. That's the thing he's playing. He has a wonderful smile. I think he's very charming. He carries the movie really well. I think that was the number one thing that, like, he's not the most interesting character in the movie, kind of by design. You know, yeah. if you're next to Lando Calrissian, that's hard. But he is someone who, like, I think, you know, obviously if he doesn't work, the movie doesn't work. If he does, the movie has a real shot at working. Yeah. I really liked his performance. Um, and I was rooting for this guy because I told you all he was the right choice. And you see what I mean now, hopefully. Yes. No. Like, I think he did a really good job. It, it is that, like, I like, you know, yeah, that twinkle in the eye thing. I think there's, again, like, the messiness of the third act makes that kind of fall apart for me. Of, like, <laughs> them trying to sort of, like, thread this line between, like, oh, I'm going to shoot this guy when he's unarmed, but I'm also going to help the rev. Like, I think there's some storytelling issues there. The third act needs a dark punch at the end. Yeah. Which, we'll get into it. Part of why they can't do the dark punch is they still end every movie with the same musical sting that they did in A New Hope, which is not yeah. a bad things have happened musical sting. Yeah, and especially if you have, because they, I think they did this in Rogue One also, right, where they abandoned the like opening crawl. Yep. Yeah, so it's like, you, if you don't have to, even though they have opening text, it's like, you might as well have made it an opening crawl. I, I thought that too. But like, but if you're not going to do the opening crawl, you also don't have to do the music sting at the end. So it's like, yeah. yeah. It's, so like some of the, the scripting issues, I think, kind of fail the performance. But the performance is 100% there. And had the, the like larger storytelling goals of the movie been more clear and better at attacking those goals, I think like it, it had a shot of being like a really great movie and a really great take on Han Solo. But it does have to, like the story has to sort of like thread this line of being like family friendly Star Wars movie but also have to end this movie with like it's like saying this guy on this path to be so jaded that like he has to we have to imagine that this guy between now and being Han Solo has like murdered and stolen and done bad fucking shit because the Han Solo we meet at the beginning of Star Wars is a bad fucking dude. It's yeah. like it's not the end of that movie that like he's a bad dude with a good heart that like like wants to do right but it's clearly not been in position and has not had people around him to push him to do that for a long time. And I don't know if this movie entirely convinces me that that's the character we get by the end. Yeah, I mean, and part of it is that I think Alden Ehrenreich has a different kind of charm than Harrison Ford does. Just now, yeah. I did not have a problem with the Harrison Ford disconnect the way you described it. But if there was anything, it's that just because of, I think, the kind of actor he is and the kind of performance he's giving, it is kind of tough to imagine the older, you know, kind of sadder darker Han Solo. This happens sometimes. It's something that um, one of my favorite TV shows right now, Better Call Saul, deals with in that, and it's the same actor, Bob Odenkirk, in this prequel, but he plays Saul in this prequel show from Breaking Bad as such a nice, interesting dude that, I mean, what it really is is you have this, like, pit in your stomach of, like, good God, what's going to happen to make him who he was on Breaking Bad? And that's what that show is about, and it leans into it. I think Solo could have done that with how, like, idealistic they portray him in some parts of it. But particularly the end of this movie needed to lean into it in that he needs to be isolated with only Chewie at the end of this thing. And he technically is on paper, but he's still, like, got this spark at the end that I'm not sure why it's still there. So, Mm -hmm. and the only thing I can think is that they wanted to do three sequels to this and have the Han Solo cinematic universe that would end with him walking into a cantina in Tatooine. But... Yeah, I. But overall, what I was, you know, I do yeah, think yeah. the performance is good. I think Harrison Ford is a tough fucking act to follow. <laughs> yeah, um, obviously, but he's great, you know. And and I've seen, you know, Harrison Ford said he really loved this movie. And usually, when someone says that about a movie, they are in some way financially tied to. I don't <laughs> listen to it. But Harrison Ford don't give a fuck. Yeah, no, he was probably high when he was watching it too. It's yeah, like if I believe him. But I, you know, I can buy that Harrison Ford would watch this, and for a character, you know, he clearly poured a lot of passion into, and say. Yeah, I think they did right by me here. Like, that's yeah. cool. Um, and I like that. But, you know, I, I, I do like that Aaron Reich is not afraid to just make it his own performance. Yes, it's, uh, the right, it's 100% the right movie. And it's the kind of thing that, like, if he had not done that and was trying to do more of a Harrison Ford impression, for me, like, I would have never been able to get into the flow back to, yeah. like, I did. When, like, the movie is going on all cylinders... Like, that's when I forget about, like, connections to Han Solo, Harrison Ford. Like, all that melts away because the movie's just doing what it needs to do. And this has a big ensemble, and he's fun with all of them. Like, he has good chemistry with everyone in the movie, and that's important. 
So let's see. Uh, Chewie's great. I just want to say. Of course, yeah. We forget that someone is performing as Chewbacca, but they are. You know, Peter Mayhew um, retired after Force Awakens because he's like 80, yeah. <laughs> understandably. And the guy who plays him now, played him in Last Jedi as well, is Junas Suatomo, I think is his name. He's great. He's yeah. a really good Chewie. Like, he has the, the physicality down. I love what they do with Chewie in this movie. I like how they meet. Yes, where that's, it's, a good, that's a good scene. That's a great scene. And I just, I love that, like, of course that's how Han and Chewie became friends. Circumstance threw them into a really rough ride. They figured it out together. And then it just kind of naturally was like, their vibes just kind of gelled. And it was fun. And yeah. they had a good time together. And I like that there's no, like, one moment where Han, like, looks at Chewie and goes, Chewie, you're my best friend for life. Mm-hmm. They do that with some other things in this movie, very obviously. Yeah. They just let that develop. And, like, I'll admit it. You know, there was when Han and Chewie fly the Millennium Falcon for the first time in this movie in Act 2. I was like, yeah. Because mm-hmm. it just felt like... And that's the ultimate sign that they got those two right. Yes. Is that I got the rush of them sitting in the Millennium Falcon. And that was not guaranteed. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah. So they did that. And uh, good on new Chewbacca. Uh, yes, I 100% agree. It was like... And it just... Like you said, it, you know that it worked when it just felt right that Han and Chewie were together at the end of the movie. And it's yeah. like, like you said, there's no, like, again, there are scenes that have some very ham-fisted dialogue. But there was no ham-fisted dialogue of, like, we're, well, I get it together forever, buddy. Like, yep. let's go. Yeah, yeah. they didn't do, they have to do that. And again, some of the steps along the way here are wonky. But I do like the general feeling of there's a big ensemble, but the last two left standing are Han and Chewie. Yeah. Again, I think some of the ways they strip some of those characters away from them could be done differently. But that they are, they come together at the beginning, they're there together at the end. There's a circularness to that I like. Yeah. That I think they do well. Uh, there is one bad Chewbacca related line, which is, he says, what's your name? And he says, oh, he says, Chewbacca, cool. That's all you need to say. And then he goes, it's a little long though. I might need to shorten it. And you just, you basically want Ron Howard to come out from behind the camera and go, <laughs> get it? Wink. And then go he back. He calls him Chewy all the time. Yeah, it's like all these would be like Chewbacca, huh? And then like like someone called him up and he's like, hey, Han, we got to do something. It's like, oh, let's go, Chewie. That's all it needed to be. That's all, that That's, would be charming. That would yeah, be a cool little moment. Be good, yeah. That line stuck out like such a sore thumb of like, because also it's like, it's a three syllable name, dude. It's not like, it's not this, like, like you know, you call this dude Beckett all the time. That's not that much more of a house mouthful than Chewbacca. Like, yeah. it's fine. It's a totally normal name. Yeah, it's, it's a very weird line, but we like Han and Chewie. Uh, okay, so we've got Kira, we also meet, yep. um, played by Amelia Clark, who, great on Game of Thrones, she plays Daenerys Targaryen, has had trouble finding the right movie for her in the oh, intervening right. years, as, Genesis. as she has been vocal out there in the press. If you have not read Amelia Clark's interviews for Solo, where she just tears Terminator Genesis a new asshole, you need to do it, because it is one of the clearest examples ever of an actor not giving a fuck I've ever seen, and I love it, because, like, she goes to the lengths of saying, like, I was happy when it flopped, because I knew I'd never have to do it again. She jokes that they were shooting next to the Josh Trank Fantastic Four movie, and that the crew members on Fantastic Four had shirts that said, glad we're not on Terminator. Like, she was... (laughs) Savage about that movie. Yeah, I. It makes me wonder what her interviews are going to be about Solo three or four years from now. Is this movie did not? I mean, I, I think this movie is a good movie, but it did not. You know, it's not like the box office up. Well, we'll see. Yeah, but I like her in this. Oh yeah, no, she's good. Yeah. She's really good. She's got. I think she's a good character. I think there's some weird plot twist near the end, but <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I, I like her as a character. I think she's got good energy with the cast. I like her with Han. I, I do, again, we talked about whether those Corellia scenes earlier on are necessary or not, but I do like their energy there. Yeah. Um, I like the transformation we see in her. I like one of the, you know, all the characters here are kind of distilling different parts of Han and reflecting them back, and she is this one part, and I liked her. I think she's a good part of the movie. I agree, yeah. Yeah, so, um, Amelia Clark is cool. I'm glad to see, like, okay, it wasn't, it, it, it was Terminator Genesis' fault. It wasn't her fault. Right, yeah. It's good to know, because that's not a well-acted movie. But anyway, not her fault. Uh, let's see. What did you think of Mr. Tobias Beckett as played by Woody Harrelson? I like Woody Harrelson in anything. Yeah. He's cool. I like him. Yeah. I did too. I think they could have given him a Star Wars character name instead of just like... It just felt like somebody was reading like a like dime a dozen fucking Western novel. It's like, Tobias Beckett. Let's go with that. It's like, wait, it's not... It's... it's, it's it's Tobias Beckett and fucking Kira spelled Q I apostrophe R A and Chewbacca and Han Solo and Lando Calrissian and here's Tobias Beckett. It's like what? <laughs> Tobias Beckett would be a great name if you were making like an actual Earth Western. 
It, yes. Not if you're making the space western it's, thing. It was just, it's such a weird, especially because people also, because Tobias is the only part of the name that actually sounds like, I could buy that as like, sure, there's a Star Wars dude named Tobias. There is no Star Wars character named Beckett. Like, it is. That's such a, like, a normal Earth person last name. And everybody just calls him Beckett. And it, it's, it's not a big deal, but it's like one of those weird little things that every time someone said it, it's just like kind of took me out of the movie a little bit. But I did enjoy having Woody Harrelson in a Star Wars movie. Yes. He was very good. I, I like his specific energy throughout the film. He's yeah. great. I, and I did like when the credits rolled and it went like, you know, directed by Ron Howard, uh, Alden Ehrenreich, Woody Harrelson in the Star Wars font. I was like, that's still kind of a surreal that Woody Harrelson was in a Star Wars movie, yeah. but this was the right role for him. The name Woody Harrelson, by the way, more of a Star Wars movie <laughs> than I expect it. <laughs> That'd be great if he just, they called him Woody Harrelson. I would, yeah, I would have bought it. I, yeah. I, that, I would have been fine. I would have gotten right into the flow of the movie with Woody Harrelson as Woody Harrelson. Yes. Uh, all right, who else we got? I mean... Then you've got the uh, Lando Calrissian and his stalwart droid L3, yeah. who do steal the show for a good stretch of the film. Yes, yeah. Donald Glover, he he actually kind of drops it after a couple of minutes, but the vocal impersonation he's doing of Billy D. Williams when you first meet him is eerily spot on. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. because you hear him before you see him, and it's like, did they dub over Billy D. Williams into this movie? Like, no, Donald Glover is just a talented motherfucker. Yes, he. But Donald Glover is so fucking good as Lando in this movie. He has, like, because he, it, he, I think, does, like, this really interesting thing of kind of, like, straddling the line of doing a little bit more of, like, an impersonation, certainly than Olin Ehrenreich is doing. But, but it's, but it's still, like, making the role his own, and it feels like a, like, modernized version of Lando in some ways, and it's, like, the, the his sort of like fashion sense and the fact that he's just like every scene he is in he sticks out like a sore thumb because everything else is grimy and dark and dirty and he's wearing these pristine bright like technicolor clothes with like big flowing capes and he just has the swagger 100% of the time I did like that there is a scene where Kira and Han are kissing in his closet full of, uh, of <laughs> capes, capes yeah. and, and they, they do make a little joke about it and I thought that was a well earned joke yeah, that he I has guess. a closet full of capes yeah. on the Millennium Falcon also like the I think the best most effective bit of sort of like fan service connection to the original movies is that he always calls him Han and not Han. <laughs> really great. That's a really good attention to detail that they pull off really well and I thought like that's one that really worked for me. Like yes. Cause, Cause I like how they rewrite it here of he's, he's doing it to get on Han's nerves. Yeah. Which is not how it's played in Empire Strikes Back. It's played, well in Empire Strikes Back it's that they didn't care about pronunciation on set. That's yeah. what it is. But like they do it very well here. I love that they're not really friends in this movie uh -huh. because you know Han's kind of a dick to him yeah. and Lando's kind of a dick but like that whole first scene where they're playing cards that's great I love the callback at the end where he comes back and wins the Millennium Falcon and I love that it's this gradual like you meet Lando as the coolest guy in the galaxy and as also kind of happens in Empire Strikes Back, you strip the layers back and it's like, he's kind of a pathetic, like, like gambler, you yeah, know? Yeah, he's, he's a fuck-up in the same way that Han Solo is a fuck-up, right. but he knows how to sort of, like, dress it up nicer yes. than Han does. He does, and, yeah, Donald Glover's great, and, you know, we may not need another Han Solo movie. I would still totally watch the Lando Calrissian movie. Absolutely. Because, like, a Lando movie would have to have, like, a different tone and style yeah. to it by necessity, because he's also not, like swashbuckler he's certainly not a jedi you know so it's like a a lando movie would have to have like be something very different and i would i you know if they abandon everything else from this movie which i don't think they should because so many of the pieces of this movie are so good regardless of it being a box office flop like they they absolutely should salvage donald glover as lando and oh, put him in something else obviously that would yeah. just be printing money people would love that yeah and if they do and it's a sequel to this they should find a way for him to reconstruct l3 because L3 yes. is one of the best Star Wars characters we've gotten under the Disney regime. Would yes. you agree? Yes, like the best new characters. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she's so L3 is the droid who wants droid equal rights. She is voiced and mo capped by Phoebe Waller Bridge, who I love. She does this show um, in England that airs over here on Amazon called Fleabag that you should absolutely watch. It's so good. And she is brilliant in this. She's so funny. She leaves the movie too early because she's yeah. so great. But man, I every moment she's on screen is great. Yes, and, and there is something really fascinating about them deciding to like put in this weird little spin-off movie a character that like really like sort of recontextualizes in a diegetic sense the role of the droids in Star Wars. Where it's like, you know, you can always make your jokes outside of the movies about like, oh, the droids they're like treated like slaves and droid equal rights. It's like 
but diegetically within the movies, it's never addressed. It's like you could, I like always. It's kind of like you know, playing Pokemon and being like, oh, it's like cockfighting or whatever. You know, it's like, eh, it's fine. Like I don't ever think about it. That's just like a weird issue you have in a non-diegetic sense. I'm putting it in diegetically in the solo movie. I wonder if they're ever going to pick up those ideas in anything else. Because there's something, like, it is so good and so well done in this film, but it also is something where it's like, you kind of opened up a big can of worms that feels like it would be weird never to address again. That, like, there's a, that she starts a droid rebellion on the planet of Kessel and all this stuff. I'll just say, you know, the best character in Rogue One was a droid, the Alan Tudyuk character. Right, yeah. The best character in this movie is a droid. I, I think the clear indicator is that the next spinoff should be a droid movie. Yes, and yeah, and it is a movie about the droids fighting for equal rights, and it's like this very intense drama. Like, there's no action in it at all. It's just like you know, like all the Senate scenes from the prequels and that kind of stuff. No, no, I think it should be like you know they did that Nat Turner movie a couple of years ago sure, called yeah, The Birth yeah. of a yeah, Nation yeah. about the slave uprising. I think it should basically be like that, where a bunch of droids have an uprising and try to kill all the people. Oh, so like have it be incredibly violent. And yes, yeah, it's a very it's a violent uprising. Okay, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. sure, I can see that as well. Yeah, and it, and it should be L three starting it again because the the scene in this where she goes in to like do the computer stuff and takes off the bolt of yeah, the one restraining the restraining bolts. how barbaric how barbaric and then that droid starts going to freedom to like take all the other restraining bolts off the like domino effect of that scene and like that is a phenomenal action like like set piece scene of all the yeah. moving pieces that come together to form their fleeing from Kessel. Yeah, it's like it's this great. really smooth height that has just like bit by bit gets thrown into the most absurd chaos is like yes. they've Fucked up that. I mean, they succeed in the heist technically, but it's not. You know, they're like that. Ocean's Eight movie is coming out. They are probably going to do a much smoother heist. Yes, they are. <laughs> that, like that movie's not going to end with like the fucking L.A. riots breaking out, right? No. So it's yeah. That that was all good, and then. L3's death does lead to some of the more interesting stuff with Lando because there is that earlier scene. I love this motion where L3 comes and sits on the chair next yeah. to uh, I think it's is it Kira? It's Kira, yeah. Uh, like she's the, like she's doing the power move like Riker in Star Trek where she sits <laughs> like backwards on the chair and she talks about like being in love and it's what I love is that it's not it's it's funny but it's not quite played for laughs. Like L3 is just being completely serious. Yeah. Great moment and then later like Lando was really in love with this droid. I don't know how far they took it. Yeah. You know, Lando's a player, who knows? But like it's like weirdly like, you know, when she dies, it's very affecting. Yeah. It's it's the kind of thing that like I you know, all just kind of joking aside, I legitimately do hope that another Star Wars movie sort of like picks up some of those ideas yeah. and and makes it more central to the movie because I think mm-hmm. there's like it, like the that material in this movie makes it very clear that there's a lot of stuff to work through that works within the Star Wars universe, and I would be interested to see them make that more of a focal point for something yeah. instead of being a side bit. Absolutely. So who knows? The Lando Calrissian movie could be he and L three going around free and droids and building a droid colony somewhere. Yes, I don't know how they would fit that in with the continuity of the original trilogy, but it turns out that the twist at the end, Cloud City, all the other people are androids. I mean, you have Lobot has the weird little, like, yeah. thing on his head, so, yeah. You only see, like, three people in Cloud City, so. I mean, you have all the Ugnaughts that take C-3PO and rip him to pieces. So, That's there's true. actually, the, like, little bit we've seen of Cloud City was not the most sort of uh, nice to the droid characters we know. Yeah, they'll so. figure it out. Sure. I'm kidding. I don't know. They can, do, they can cover that in the same movie where they tell how Luke's lightsaber was recovered from right, yes. Espen. That is the one. They should cancel the Boba Fett movie and make the Luke's lightsaber a Star Wars story. <laughs> hey, maybe that is the Ryan Johnson trilogy. It's, All three movies, The Search be. for the Lightsaber. Yes. All right. Anyway, yes. Liked Lando. Liked L3. Don't, are there any other significant characters? Okay, there's Paul Bettany. Oh, right. Who, yes, as the villain. Yeah. Who, like Josh Brolin, is just having a good month of being in multiple blockbusters and me thinking... God, Paul Bettany should be in more stuff. I really yes. like Paul Bettany. Yeah, it, like I feel like it for whatever. I don't know if maybe he's been in stuff recently that I just haven't seen. But I feel like I haven't seen him in a lot of stuff recently, and it's just like that one-two punch yeah. of Avengers. And this is like, yeah, Paul Bettany's really fucking good. He is, and yeah, he's. I like him. At, I can't remember the character's name, but as like the, he's the bad guy. You as know. as the bad guy, who's, the crime boss. Yes, yeah, with like all the the James Bond villain scars on his face and everything. No, he's a he's a great like crime boss character, and I yeah. love all the scenes with him. You know, I the the third act obviously gets messy, but when you have the standoff with Han and him and Han, you know, is playing the long con and everything, there's a lot of good stuff there. Yes, and he, he's appropriately intimidating, particularly, I particularly love the first scene between him and Han, where you just get so much of a sense of, like, 
Yeah. Han is so out of his fucking depth with this dude yes. and, and just survives by the sheerest like threat of luck. Yes. It's, it's, yeah, it's really well played. Um, so what other things? So that, those are the characters. We liked all the performances. Really, as I said, deep bench cast. Yeah. You know, Tanny Newton is in the movie too as the, the, Paul, the Tobias Beckett character's girlfriend. I did yeah. think for a character who died like five minutes after appearing, it was weird to cast Tandy Newton. Because I see Tandy Newton, and I know she hasn't been in a ton of stuff recently. Yeah. But I do see Tandy Newton and expect her to be a main character. Yeah, which is another main reason why it's so bizarre that yeah. that F- <laughs> Act 3 reveal is not that character. I just... There has to be a version where that was what it was, and then they just like I don't cut know. that it's, side. It's so bizarre. I mean, yeah. hell, it could have been half of that camera pan is Tandy Newton, and then when they get around, they've CGI in the little girl's face. I don't know. Yeah, we don't know what happened. So very strange. I can't wait for the tell all on this movie. Yeah, that's going to be a hell of a fucking story. Yeah, because we've gotten a lot of one side of it. We haven't gotten the other, so it's going to be interesting. But all right, characters. What other things did you like about this movie while we're on that pat, uh, track? I mean, you talked about the second act. It's yeah. I, you know I think more than anything it just moves so much smoother like there's a clear goal they really it's very creative in how it's staged I think Ron Howard does great work with some of the big action scenes there the Kessel Run itself is very fun all yeah that stuff. it's just there's a great sense of like focus on the different characters and you always know what each character is doing and why they're doing it as we talk about like the spiraling out of chaos over the course of that heist is really well done and it's the kind of thing of like you know you've because this movie does traffic in a lot of cliches, like a lot of cliches, and you've seen like sequences in scenes like what is in Act Two, but I think they they put enough of their own spin and flavor on it that it does not feel like a cliche, which is like really to the movie's credit because it's like the kind of thing that I, I I don't know for some reason like going into some of that stuff I like was expecting to be I think is how slow the pace had been up to that point a bit bored by it, but once it started moving, it's like, no, this is fucking really well done. Yeah, and again, yeah. I think if you had cut off the first 15 minutes of the movie, you probably wouldn't have felt that lethargic going into it because yeah. it would have all been a direct arc towards that. Exactly, yeah. Because that is the point in the movie where like everything is very clear. The motivations are all really strong for the characters. Like, all the, the bouncing is really well done. And it has, I think, one of my favorite sort of space sequences in Star Wars. It's of, so different than any other one yeah, I can think of. Yeah, escaping Kessel, and there's like good little like sort of shades of Han going into the asteroid field in Empire Strikes Back, and, and it's one of those things that I don't know if it's like intended to be directly referential to that, but if it is, like it's smartly done, because it's just like sort of echoes that he's going to do that in like like something similar to this in the future. Yes. And, I, but he does it a lot smoother that time than he does this time. Totally, and, and it is something where I really... More than any other part of the movie, you could feel him becoming the Han Solo we know in that yeah. stretch. And that's what's so invigorating about it, right? Like, so once, like, Lando and L3 are out of commission and he's going to have to pilot the Falcon, you're just, I was, like, on the edge of my seat. Like, we're getting to it. And it's built to that so well at that point. And then the payoff of that, the Kessel Run sequence, I think, delivers the goods. All the crazy stuff he does there, it really does feel like this is how a younger Han Solo would approach this situation. And I can buy that he did this crazy shit, yeah. you know? And I think they nail that. And talking about the, the, the asteroid field thing, um, John Powell's score, which is really good, and we'll yes, talk about yeah, it because yeah, yeah. it's surprisingly great. He does not actually lean on John Williams' music that much. And he doesn't even try to do like John Williams-esque themes all that much. But he does there go into, it's like a great little medley of Han Solo pieces. Like, and he specifically pulls out, it is the asteroid run sequence is played there. Mm-hmm. Um, mixed with some other pieces of Star Wars and Han Solo specific music. But I think they earn it in that moment of like yeah. bringing in some of the big gun you know, musical elements of Han Solo. I think it's very well learned, and it's an invigorating sequence visually, musically. It's very creative. It's good. Yeah, that, because that is also where they get to like sort of st- like <clears throat> stress and like like sort of stretch their muscles with like having more kind of exotic visuals. I particularly love, you know, you may know me. I love all the shit with the giant space monster. Of yes. course, like that shit's awesome. But like particularly building up to that sequence where it's like. You know, it's probably all CGI or whatever, but it's like a long shot away from like in the Millennium Falcon is a very small, like little kind of like white disc, and then there's like just black fog, and then the monster's like eye opens and kind of comes through. Like all that stuff is really well done, and they like communicate the size and weight and kind of like fear of this giant fucking like nebula guzzling space monster. And and then when they like defeat the space monster by basically like tricking it to fly into a black hole, that's pretty cool. And there's also if you pay attention to those effects, 
shockingly gruesome. Like, yes. it sort of, like, gets split inside out and, like, comes apart and falls into the singularity. It's like, I didn't think that they would go that far. Like, that's pretty gross. I mean, it is in the background of the shot, so it's, like, not front and center. They don't linger on it, but it's pretty gross. Yes. Uh, I also like, this was in the trailer, but it plays even better in the movie, the moment where Han takes out the last fighter ship by doing just a roll with the yeah. Falcon and hitting it. It's great. Yes, yeah, because it, it, it plays really well in context of how they set that up, and and because they don't focus it on, on it as being like, oh, Han just did this amazing thing, it's just something he just sort of does in the middle of this dog Well, because it's the kind of thing Han does not do later, because he has better skills to evade these guys, Yeah, but it's like... What have I got? I've got a ship and I can roll it. Yeah, Fuck it. It's, it's a pretty wide ship. This will probably work. Yes. And hopefully we won't blow up. Yes. And and when he when they arrive on the planet at the end and the Falcon is just totally fucked. Yeah. That's great. Donald Glover's reaction is is outstanding. Loved all of that. Yeah. Um other elements of the film I really want to focus on, like I said, the production design is really good in this yeah. movie. I also thought, my brother and I turned to each other and said, I said, does that look like Mass Effect to you, a lot of this? I'm like, yeah, it does. And it's, I can see that, yeah. And, and what it specifically is, is all the stuff in uh, the crime syndicate, like the Crimson Dawn, all mm-hmm. of their stuff. Yeah, it's very Omega from, yeah. yeah Mass but what II. I was thinking is that, like, I love that we've gone around where Mass Effect is clearly heavily influenced by Star Wars yeah. in multiple eras, all these different ways, and we've come back around to Mass Effect being enough of a big cultural world building like signifier that Star Wars can feel like it's borrowing it from it a little bit, yeah. and just the cycle continues. That was kind of fun, but great production design, I think, and I also think, it, you know, like Rogue One technically takes us to places we hadn't been, but it's just versions of sets from the original trilogy all yeah. the time. This doesn't do that. I think it really does try to imagine, like, it's not like, here's another cantina, and there's someone, you know, there is a thing where what someone is, like, playing music in the Crimson Dawn ship, but it doesn't feel like the exact same thing. It does feel like we're going to places Han Solo would have been, but maybe Luke Skywalker wouldn't have. Yeah, because it's, that the, the, like, the Crimson Dawn have a much different flavor than, like, Job of the Hutt. Because, like, the closest yeah. thing is the beginning of Return of the Jedi when you see Job of the Hutt's, like, sort yeah. of, like, palace and everything in Tatooine. Yeah. But this is much more sort of upper class. Yeah, you, you, again, it kind of feels like that sort of, like, the private rooms in Club Omega from yeah. Aspect 2 or something. I liked the Kessel planet when we go there. Yeah. I liked, um, the, the, the planet at the beginning. What's it called? Uh, Corellia. Yeah, Corellia. I liked Corellia when what we saw of it. So, very good production design, and most importantly, this movie has some of my favorite Star Wars cinematography ever. Yes. This was shot by yeah. Bradford Young, uh, who is a great cinematographer. I almost said up and coming because that's how I've described him in the past, but he has an Oscar nomination now, so I don't think I can say that. Right. Um, you would probably know him best from the movie Arrival. He shot that, and obviously great looking movie. Um, he shot Selma, the Ava DuVernay film about Martin Luther King Jr. Really, really talented cinematographer and has a very distinct look which he brings to this where he... Like, he, it's a very dark movie in terms of its palette and how he works with shadows, but it's not as simple as saying it's, like, a colorless or dark movie. Right. Like, he just does these things with, like, light, shadow, and texture, where it feels like the contrast and the gaps between lights and shadows and what does come through the image creates its own kind of geometric patterns. I think he's a really interesting cinematographer, very good fit for the Star Wars universe, and having just watched A New Hope, I don't think Star Wars has had this much... Like texture and grit to it since seventy seven. Yeah, like I it agree. really like captures that without looking like a New Hope. It is not shot like a New Hope, but it has like Bradford Young would have been a total star in the nineteen seventies if with uh-huh. his skills, yes. he would have been really good at it. I th- yeah, I think that is a good way to put it. That it does feel shot in a lot of ways like a seventies movie and has yeah. like that kind of grit yeah. to it for sure. And it is the kind of thing that when I saw the trailers, I didn't like. I wasn't like excited about the way the movie looked, but actually watching the movie, it works a lot better for me. Yes. It's like, because I was concerned about it feeling like it had no color in it, but that's not the case. No. And his cinematography is hard to get on like a small screen or if you're at a theater that isn't projecting very well, like yeah. if you have a dim bulb, that's, it's not going to look good. And I have seen some people complaining, like I can't see the movie. It's like, that's your theater's fault, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, because, yes, it is a complicated image. I will say, like, probably when the Blu-ray comes out, that's going to look great, and you'll be able to, you know, look at it on. If you have a nice TV, it'll look good, and you can probably adjust the brightness and things. But, like, yeah, I think it's a... Uh, it's Because it's also not doing, like... Like, Rogue One had good cinematography, but it also, like, went for a lot of, like, these kind of money shots yes. that looked great in the trailer, 
Most of them didn't make it to the movie, and the rest of it was just, this is Star Wars. Mm -hmm. It's not bad, but it's just, it's what is what it is. I think this is a movie that, I don't know if there's a ton of money shots you could pull out of it, but I think every shot is good. Yeah, it's, it's more functional in that yes. way to, to the storytelling than it's just Rogue One. Very genuinely good cinematography. I yeah. love the way it looks. I think overall, Last Jedi is still probably the most visually striking of the new Star Wars movies because of things like its use of the color red and whatnot. But you know, I already I think of Solo and I think of these those like golds and blacks that yeah. you get so many of. It really is a visually rich movie. So I like that about it a lot. John Powell's score. I want to talk about that. I have asked repeatedly, is Star Wars, can you do it without John Williams? The answer is still up in the air because John Williams did work on this movie. He wrote right. the main theme, which John Powell then uses for Han Solo. But I do think John Powell, is a, who is the best composer no one talks about, he is really talented. He did the, the, the Jason Bourne movies. Right. Amazing scores. I think his best work is for How to Train Your Dragon 1 and 2 for DreamWorks. Those are great movies and have some of the best... You know, theme motif driven scores of I think the era we're living in. It's one of the few times I've watched out of a movie in like the last 10 years and been like, I have to listen to that soundtrack. He's really talented. And I think he did a good job here, in part because he's not just doing a Williams impersonation for most of it. It is Williams esque. It uses the horns, it uses the kind of Star Wars orchestra set up. But it is not like Michael Giacchino's score for Rogue One was so bad because all of it is like he would just do a Star Wars theme. And then tweak it so it sounds wrong to your ear. Right, <laughs> Where it's yeah. like, da, 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 da. <laughs> like, that kind of thing is all over Rogue One. It's like, shut up! Stop that! Like, that's annoying. Just recycle John Williams if you're going to do it. And I think John Powell, like, brought in some really interesting themes here. I love, there's some specific musical identities he gives characters that are really interesting. Like, the music on the train heist sequence in mm -hmm. particular is fantastic. But very, very well-scored movie. And I'm like, okay... This is a step in the direction of maybe we can, we, if there's the right people and the right outlook on it, we can have a post-John Williams Star Wars musical landscape. I liked it. I agree. Yeah. All right. Um, i trying to think if there's anything else to cover before we get into some of the rougher stuff. Yeah. Again, I want to stress, and we'll, we, throughout all of this, I did ultimately like the movie. I like where it you know, landed on things, and even at its messiest, which is probably that third act, there were still a lot of things I was enjoying. But, but I did realize this movie was going to have some rough waters about five minutes in when Han Solo goes to an Imperial uh, registrar. Oh, God, yeah. And I, says, had, I had fucking forgotten about yeah, this until you just brought and, it up. And says he wants to sign up for the Empire, which is a really cool idea. Like, I actually liked the, the world building of, like, the Empire is just a thing. And kind of like, if you're a kid with no options in the USA, you might go join the military. Yeah. The, that's a cool like view on that, but he goes up in you know normal scenes. What's your name, Han? It, and for what I thought this would have been is that, but they do the title earlier. What it should be is he should say Han, and he'd be like, "What's your last name?" And Han would kind of look up, and then it would cut to the title. Sure, yeah. And that would be it would be cheesy, but that would be like the good cheesy that yeah. we expect. Yeah, it would it would make me smile. Instead, uh huh. He says, "What Han? What's your name, Han?" He's like, "Do you have a last name?" He's like, "I have no family. I'm alone." He says, "Oh, you're alone, are you?" Solo, then. Your name will be Han Solo. And apparently, the name Han Solo comes in this crazy space with all the crazy names in alien languages. His name comes from the English word for solitude. Never knew that, Sean. Yeah. Can't say I didn't learn things from this movie. Yeah, apparently Latin exists in the Star Wars universe or something. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's particularly weird because we then... I guess the reason he does that is because he doesn't want anyone to know his full name... But in the moment, I thought it was that he's a, he's like an orphan, a street urchin, he has no last name. But then we later learned that he knew his dad and that his dad worked on fucking the same kind of Carlian frigates or whatever that's that true. the Millennium Falcon is. So it's like, I, I, like I, I mean, that's me like retroactively like trying to justify, it's a terrible fucking sequence. There's no justification from it from like a storytelling aesthetic purpose at all. But just trying to get in the head of the writers like or in like the context of the movie... The logic for that sequence utterly like falls apart to me when they introduce the dad character. You have to like retroactively like put that back in. I think introduce that character. They reference him, but still, it's like yeah, he assumedly has a family name. Yeah, he and has he, a surname, and he just doesn't say it. And I guess, and and then for the rest of his life, he just goes as Han Solo. It's like I don't. I wh why? <laughs> it is why, why put that in. Your it movie? is the worst line in the movie, right? 
Yeah, it's like the worst like sequence of the. It's the most. It's it's like you could put that into a fucking like like take that out of the movie like as it is shot and performed and everything and put that into a fucking like Saturday Night Live sketch from when like Alden Ehrenreich hosts Saturday Night Live and I would not be able to tell the difference. It's like yeah, that's that's just a like parody of shitty cheesy Star Wars dialogue or something. Like this is awful. I mean one. Why is it important to tell us how he got his name? Like, that would be like if in episode one, quite like he's just named Anakin, and Qui-Gon Jinn at one point sees him walk across a tall bridge and says, You know what? You walked really high up, kid. Your name is now Skywalker. Yeah. And he'd be like, Okay, mister. And then you go on with the movie, and then every time you hear Skywalker from then on out, you face palm a little bit inside. Uh-huh. And it is like. Because Thomas pointed this out to me, that it's like a big, like in The Force Awakens, for instance, it's a big emotional moment when you learn that Kylo Ren is actually Ben Solo. (laughs) But now you think, oh, the Solo comes from when Han was a kid, and this weird guy who has an interest in Latin roots, I guess, decided to name him after the word for solitude. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the only thing that would have been better, like, this is actually what they should, if they were going, to, if they were stuck on this fucking idea that his name is not actually Han Solo, and the Solo part is some sort of weird-ass alias, for no good reason, but if you're stuck on that, they should have had the, the dude say, like, oh, okay, no family name, huh? Well, then, Han Doe, and just write that, it's like, I'm a dude, 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 let's, no, let's not... How about Han Solo? This is our okay. Fine, Han Solo. Okay, there we go. Like that would have been legitimately a better version of that fucking scene. Then going, it's just hmm, hmm. You're alone, are you? Huh? Huh? Hmm, what would? What's another? What's a synonym for alone? Huh, I just Solo. You're Han Solo. There we go. There's two levels to this. There's the meta element that who in the world has been asking. How Han Solo got his name. Oh. He's not Santa Claus. It's not a, it's he's not Darth Vader. It's not a title. <laughs> it's just his name. Like we just took that as his name is Han Solo. Like Luke Skywalker. You yeah. just Or Tobias t- Beckett. Or Toby or Toby the good old Toby Beckett. <laughs> but but buddy Toby, yeah. we you just accept it. But so there's that level. There's also the if you are going to introduce that into your movie, and I do think this is where most of the clunky lines come from, is ignoring this thing. Major character shifts or moments like that in good screenwriting should come from fulfilling a need. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, like Han needs something and that is why something is created or fulfilled. And they do a lot of that in this movie, you know, need, payoff, setup, that kind of thing. Um, But that moment, like, there is no, he's not, like, like, he doesn't have to conceal his name. They don't know anything. The Empire is just taking people. Yeah. He can tell his name. It doesn't give him something new. It doesn't, like, give him this newfound sense of identity. It's, it like, even if you knew nothing about larger Star Wars fandom, if you knew, if you had never heard of Han Solo, that line would sound weird. Yeah. You know, because it fulfills no function for the character. So I really... There is a smattering of lines throughout this movie that feel like the last pass done at the script is that they handed it off... To someone who had just watched Star Wars for the first time, and like an intern at Disney, yeah. like some millennial intern, didn't really know Star Wars. They had him watch A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back and not Return of the Jedi because it doesn't really matter for Han Solo. Yeah. And they had him watch those two movies and then say, go online, research Star Wars fandom, and we need ten zingers in the movie to like get the fans on board. And this intern wrote... Uh, okay, his name is Solo. And then later, they have that pilot dude who's with Beckett. And he I was like, um... I'm going to open a cantina someday, somewhere not too cold, but not too warm. Wink! Yeah. Get it? Get it? It's like, hmm, Chewbacca, that's a bit of a mouthful. I'll have to come up with a nickname for you. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, yes. I mean, on, this, this script has structural issues, but moment to moment, it is not, like, poorly written. Like, but you get these zingers every so often that really feel like someone else came in and did the zinger pass. Yes, it, it's like, you know... The Han crash lands of the Millennium Falcon comes out. It's like, hey, I just did the Kessel Run in under 12 parsecs. Wink, wink. Hey, that's a line in that other movie. At least that one actually has like... At least, I will say, at least that one, the way Alden Ehrenreich plays it, I like the idea that this is something... He played it like Han is so proud and he's going to fucking cling to this line. And I could get that out of it. But yes, it is. It's distracting because it's we just don't need it. Yes, it is. Especially because... No, other than that, like... 
The word Parsec is used in this movie more times than it's used in any other Star Wars movie combined because it's only ever used once in any other Star Wars movie and it's used incorrectly in Star Wars A New Hope when Han Solo says it because of Parsec. They, they justify it in this movie that he's taking a shortcut. Yeah. But, like, obviously the Parsec sounds like it's time because of seconds. It's actually a measurement of distance, like, astronomical, like, terms. But it's, like... It's so obnoxious and like you would if that line did not exist about the, the twelve parsecs in Star Wars episode four, they would never use the words parsec in this movie. Ever, 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 fucking ever. It no. would never happen. And that's the thing that like fucking drop kicks you out of the movie, because it's like it is that thing of like someone's yanking on your your shirt and be like, Hey buddy, listen to this. Parsecs, huh? Well, that's the thing that they said in that Star Wars movie, and they didn't know what the fuck they're talking about. I think they could have gotten away with the parsecs thing if the only line was Donald Glover saying no one's ever made the castle run in under 20 parsecs. Yeah. I would have been like, okay, that's fine. Like, yes. And then we, we take that, and then he does it in less than 20, and we just in our heads go, and that's why he said 12 in the other movie. Yes. But then they, you're right, they need to be like, do you get it? Do you? Do you? Do you, you get it? Did you see that other Star Wars movie? Do you know some obnoxious person that knows what a parsec is that tells you that every five seconds? But it really is. There's just... It, and it feels like all of these different visual moments you could just kind of slice out of the film Absolutely. and you would never know they're gone. That's why it, it does feel like a, just the zinger pass by the Star Wars intern. You it's, know. it's something where I'm looking forward to the, the fan edit of Solo, a Star Wars story that's just like cut all this shit, just like cut this out, cut this out, cut the first 10 minutes out, cut that line out, just get rid of it. Just yeah. get the fuck rid of it. Why is it in this movie? So anyway, there's there's those clunkers and those are obviously very clunky and distracting. Yeah. Um, you know, I the first act obviously has some problems getting where it needs to go. But I don't think the biggest structural problems really rear their head until the last third, as you mm-hmm. would say. Yeah. And again, I think there's a lot of good material, good character moments, things I liked in here, but boy, is there a lot of plot so going on. Like, and if there's so much of one of which, one of my favorites um, is the like notion that Han Solo apparently comes to the realization at this point in the movie that the crime organization, the, the criminal world that he's working for, are apparently bad people. It's like he beats these other people that sit down and be like, like dramatically take off their helmet for five minutes and don't know who they are. And then they're like, and, and these people have been murdered and their food has been taken and their lives destroyed. And by who? And then they draw on the, like, the thing in dust, the symbol for Crimson Dawn, you assume, because it's like not that distinct a symbol. And like, I just... I know that it's it's on Kira's tattoo, but you also never get that great a look at it. So it's like, I just, when they draw that symbol, kind of like with taking the helmet off, it's like, I just have to assume what this is and why it's significant. Because it's not actually communicating that very effectively in a symbolic sense. And then that's when Han's like, well, you know, this, you know, Toby, we got to help these people. It's like, we can't, we can't give this shit over. We have to help these people. We have to do this. Like, what do you think you've been doing? You've been doing the whole time. Like, you've been working for fucking criminals. They murder and steal. Like, what's going on? There is a thematic thing here I do like, though. Which is that, again, like, this is a persistent thing in the the Alden Ehrenreich performance and in the direction in the writing. Is that the Han Solo persona is this thing he puts on to be tough. And because that he thinks that's how he's going to make it in this world. Right. And over and over in the movie, just as in the original trilogy, when he is presented with the hard moments of doing the actual tough guy bad thing and not, he usually does the good thing because he is kind of a good guy at heart. I think the line from Kira, what you actually are is a good man, is a smart line that cuts to the heart of that yeah. character. And I do, th- and I agree there is obviously clunkiness in how they present this. I think the general idea of him realizing he had not thought of the ramifications of his actions and being presented directly with evidence of it would get him to feel like he has to do the right thing here. I have no problem with that. Sure. I do think, obviously, if you're going to do that, the people who present that to him have to come not so far out of left field. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like In, in such a way that they feel like... They are from like like I can basically have forgotten that they were even in the movie. Like yes. they are in that like ice like planet bank high scene, and then there's like one quick shot of them when they take the Millennium Falcon. It's like we're tracking them, so we'll show up in the movie later. I had completely forgotten that that happened. It's until way they later. Up. It's a full like an hour after that, yeah. so it's really a long time. Yeah, 
And, and so, yes, that is that is the issue with that scene to me. I, again, and this is a persistent thing, I think there are persistently thematic kernels that are smart there. And I think the general story arc of him getting the heist of his dreams and then realizing this isn't the right thing to do and having it be again that moment of the mask, kind of the facade not holding up when he's the, the pressure is put on him. That's not a bad idea. Yeah, but it I think can't. It's... That turn cannot happen that late in the movie and so suddenly that like he doesn't. There's no like moment of hesitation on Han's part when that occurs. It's like these people show up, say like actually the people you work for do bad stuff, and then Han just basically like there's a cut. You assume some time has passed, I guess, from the cut, but then Han is immediately just t- telling Toby like, "Hey, man, we can't do this." It's there's no like soul searching. There's no like nothing happens to Han that he has to make that choice. It's not like. In Star Wars, episode four, when we like see him make a similar thing again, there it's he fucks the fuck off, says, no, I'm not doing this, and then comes in at the last second, and like that's where like the drama and the character moment has happened. Here it's just like, snap, he's, he's, he has decided that, like, oh, I have come to this realization that the people I'm working for are actually evil, which was not a thing I had come to realize when I was working for criminals and murderers I mean, and thieves. Let's put it this way. You could simplify this and have it work a lot more elegantly, and it would, ele- it would make all of this act more elegant if he decides to go through with it and then in the meeting with the crime boss... Like last minute says, yes, ah, fuck it, and pulls his gun. Like yes. you know, you know what? I can't do it. And think of how many steps you cut out of the uh-huh. of Beckett leaving, telling about Jabba, the clunky line, double crossing, coming back, Kira, if it were just they all move towards that location, and then Han's like, oh, I can't do this, fuck, you know, and it's like Chewie, are you with me? You know that kind of thing. Yeah, and and it would be like a cheerworthy moment, you know. But you would have built. You're right. You're right. I mean, again, thematic kernels. Good I, good intentions, bad execution. Yeah. Which then also going on with like rough execution but good intentions is there are like three too many backstabs in the backstab sequence of like it's that it, it felt like if you told me that fucking like Stephen Moffat got drunk and wrote that bit, I would have believed you were just like, no, I have actually been doing this the whole time, but no, I've actually been it's like the sequence in Curse of the Fatal Death, the the joke like 1998 or whatever, uh, Doctor Who bit that he, that Stephen Moffat wrote, where the Doctor and the Master literally just like, but I went in time even further back and bribed the architect with this so that he would make a track platform there, but so that I went back even further because I knew you'd do that. It's that is like every single character has backstabbed every other character like two times. It's fucking absurd. It is because because obviously and again good intent because betrayal is a theme of the movie yeah. and you have to have something there that's going to hurt. But they save up all their backstabbing for the last ten minutes. You know they're like we could have spread out the backstabbing, but we're going to put it all in one boat. And so yeah, I mean, what's the sequence of events? He goes and talks to Beckett. Beckett lays out that we're going to go meet up with Jabba the Hutt and have fun adventures in Solo Two, another Star Wars story. Yeah. And then Beckett leaves, and you're like, he's probably coming back. But he so then he and Kira decide they're going to go to Paul Bettany. Yeah. And then they have given him what Paul Bettany assumes is fake coaxium because Han told. Uh, Woody Harrelson, Toby, about yes. the plan. And so then Toby comes in, says, but I I told Paul Bettany that you gave him a fake. And Han's like, but I knew that you would know. So instead I put in the... So the fake is with the Marauders, and this is the real stuff. And then they freak out. And then Kira... Oh, they but actually the- there's another step in there where Han assumes that Kira betrayed him, or at least says that he assumes that Kira betrayed him, which you then later find out that Han knew that Kira did betray him, that because he knew that Toby was actually going to betray him. But there's another little micro fake out backstab in the middle there where it's like, Kira, did what did you tell him? And it's like, Oh, Kira didn't tell me anything. Actually it was Toby over here in, in behind door number two. And then later there's a scene where it looks like Kira isn't going to kill Paul Bettany. She's going to kill Han, but then she actually does kill Paul Bettany. So, like, there are a million potential and actual backstabs yeah. in there. When, here's the thing, the one that matters, and it, it dilutes this, and this is the problem, yes. is that Kira has to be the one who does it. Mm-hmm. Like, Kira yeah. has to be the one who, and it doesn't have to be she sells him out to Paul Bettany. The general arc is correct, that what she has to do is choose her life of crime and glamour over him. That's what it has to be. And they get there. But they kind get of. there after so much shoe leather of back and forth and, and Beckett, but not Beckett, but it was Beckett, and this, blah, 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 and, and she's talking to Darth Maul for some fucking reason that we'll get to, yeah, we'll, because yeah. that was the most baffling thing I've ever seen in a Star Wars movie. 
I, you could hear the confusion in the theater. We'll talk about it in a second. But yeah, and, and so it, when you get to the thing that actually matters, it just kind of dilute. It, it feels so diluted. It feels like they, like, because they spend the whole movie setting up that Kira is going to betray Han because her new life and, like, everything, her new situation is more important to her and that Han is not going to be able to handle that. That's, like, so much of the emotional momentum and thematic material and plot, like, stuffing is focused around that concept but then, but then it just feels like something where somebody along the way just decided, well, what people actually like are like big surprises and not actually like, right. like you know, payoff and plot, which is what people actually like reasonable payoff in stories. They don't give a fuck about surprises. Everyone thinks like, oh, like the internet culture makes people think like, oh, you want a huge twist that surprises you. So it's like instead we'll have Toby be the one that shows up and portrays Han, which is like. Technically not surprising, but is to was to me surprising in execution entirely because there's no good story reason for it to happen. Yes. So it's not surprising in the sense that like this character would never betray Han. It's more surprising of like, why would the writers write this? What's the point? This isn't set up. It doesn't do like Han has no like incredible trust for Toby. Uh, clearly, because he knew that Toby was going to betray him. So there's no, like, big... There's no actual betrayal. There's no real surprise that happens. And so then when Kira very quietly, sort of, just chooses her own life over Han, kind of, it, there's no impact to it. Because it's like... I, I guess, like, there's no even real indication that they would never see each other again. Or, like, there's... She doesn't actually betray him. No, she Which doesn't. is the problem. Because they... <laughs> like, if you're going to set that up... You need to pay it off, or if you're going to like have a twist in how you pay it off, there needs to be some like compelling thematic reason. And, and I don't know how much of this is them saying we've got to save that for the sequel. Which right. Obviously, a lot of this feels like that because the right ending to this for me is maybe because I do like the scene where he shoots Beckett. I think it's a good scene, but yeah. the uh, I think Beckett could betray him somewhere in there. I do think what should probably happen is like a good moment would be let's say they take out the Paul Bettany character, Beckett runs away or something. And then they have the coaxium, and he's like, okay, Kira, let's get this back to the people. I can even see the cinematography of it. He turns to do it, and he hears a gun cock, and he turns back, and she's like, I can't do that, Han. And she takes the coaxium and leaves him and goes off. That would be the right betrayal, right? Yes. She yes. chooses her life of crime. She wasn't actually in it for his reasons, and he's very disillusioned in humanity because yeah. of that. Checks and, all the boxes. Yes, and, and where like Han has been trying to do the right thing, but fails to be able to do the right thing because yes. of her that is what sets him on the path to then feeling like well none of like it's life is bullshit none of it it's not worth trying to be the good guy because it will never work out yes. like that would be what needs to happen instead of just being like Han you should go after uh, Toby and help Chewie don't worry I'll be right there and then I guess maybe Han kind of understands that she's just gonna fuck off and leave yeah. but sort of he just leaves this like and then and then you have do you have Darth Maul? Do we want to talk about let's it get now? To, let's get to Darth Maul okay. in a second. I want to finish with... Because, again, it's all so messy. I, the scene where he goes after Beckett, I did like... Because I think of the energy between Woody Harrelson and Alden Elrond Reich. I think the idea of... And it's obviously a callback to the Han shot first thing. Yes. But the idea of, like, they're talking, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're building up to this, and Han just does it. Really good moment. I don't know if it feels built up. It right. doesn't feel and if, it had, earned. if it had come on the heels of what we just described of like maybe a direct betrayal from Kira and Han's like fuck all of this and kills him, that would feel very earned. Yeah, and I and then it's because again the movie gets to the right place, which is Han and Chewie isolated with the Millennium Falcon, but the moments that get us there matter. And the way they move the chess pieces is just not the right or most economical or most thematically meaningful way to do it. You yeah. know? So that's all I have to say about that, I yes. guess. It's, it's frustrating. Because yeah. it's, it's like the reason why it's frustrating is because so many of the pieces are so right. Yes. That when they fumble the landing and they kind of fumble the setup at the beginning, it's, it's infuriating because it well, could like, have been such a better movie. Like I'll say this. We didn't have this much to say about Rogue One. Because... <laughs> Because it's just a mess. Because it's just a mess. And I think the third act is very well done with the giant flaming asterisk that there is no earthly reason to care about a single character on screen yeah. other than, I like Donnie Yen. You know, like, other than that, and all the actors in that movie are good, but it's yeah. like, there's no characters in that movie. There's just pawns. And so you get to that, and you can analyze it if you want, but it's utterly meaningless at the end of the day. 
I don't think Solo has that. I think it's hard. It's in the right place, and I think it's got a lot of intelligence to it, which is why what's frustrating about it is frustrating for very different reasons. Yes, and and while I'm thinking about it, I also want to point out one of the things I really do appreciate about Solo Star Wars story is that this is the only Disney Star Wars movie so far that feels like it is not flying by at a million miles a minute. That's like the pacing of this movie is reasonable. It's yeah. like every other Star Wars movie from Episode 7, Rogue One, and even Last Jedi, which I like a lot, but one of the main problems with that movie is like it just fucking goes, 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 and never s- slows down and has moments for the characters. Solo like has some pacing issues at the beginning of having too much material and taking too long to get off the ground. But when it is moving, it is moving at a pace that feels reasonable, that still stops to have character moments and, like, breathe. I'm glad you said that, because I... All the problems we're talking about, I really enjoyed this movie. Like, it felt like sitting back with, like, a good drink or a good book or something. Like, I just enjoyed my two hours with it. Like, problems aside, I just like the pace and the world building... And the just general atmosphere to it, you know, I think Ron Howard is a tremendously, like, competent craftsman in mm-hmm. this way. It was just like, yeah, this is a this is a Star Wars movie. And I yeah. like it, and it feels right, and there's issues here and there. And I think that is a really important point. Because I agree with that general criticism. They move, you know, in, I think for episode 7 and 8, it's because they have 5 billion characters. Uh, yeah. Who are all really good, but, you know, you 5 billion characters. Yeah. Uh, you know, and yeah, Rogue One, whatever the fuck that movie was. But yeah, I, I, it is something in this movie that I hope future Star Wars movies take a look at it and say, yeah, you know, that relaxed thing was actually kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. It, it turns out it helps if you stop for a second and have like a like a colorful moment between the characters, like small ones, like having even though like it's you know a reference to a Star Wars thing. But it worked for me because it's like so casually done. Is Chewie and Toby playing the chess thing on the yeah. board? That's like, yeah, it's technically a reference to Chewie playing chess with C-3PO. But luckily they don't do, like... I thought that wasn't going to be a moment where Chewie rips off Toby's arms. Like, <laughs> that would have been a twist. They do make a Chewie rips off the arms reference later, which, again, like, you don't really need it, but it, that was not one of the bad ones to me. But it, oh, but I love that because it builds to a great joke, which is that but his uniform was my size. Yes. So, that was yeah. good. So it, Yeah, so, but yeah, like, you... In any of those other Star Wars movies, you don't get that little moment of Toby and Chewie playing chess together and and there's that little line of, of I think it's like that's where he's kind of been parting that like wisdom of like oh you like know somebody you can predict them and that kind of stuff yeah. it's like those moments are some of the, the little moments that don't necessarily always like stand out to us to talk about in a podcast discussion like this but works so well to make the movie gel together. There's a bunch of great moments with like Beckett's crew and him early yeah. on where they're just like around the campfire or where he's talking to that cool four armed pilot dude who dies, which is I kinda like that character. Yeah. yeah, there there are moments like that and I do appreciate that a lot. Uh okay. Yeah. Darth okay. Well, yeah, we have here's, to talk about it. <laughs> here's the thing. We have to talk about the red horn fucking Zabrick in the room. Um I, when I say I could feel the confusion in the theater, I, I've never seen this in a movie before. Other than maybe, I mean, I would say maybe with some of the like shitty DC movies, but mostly that's just people just wanted to die, and that's a very different feeling. <laughs> people didn't want to die in this movie. What it was is you're going to the movie, and then Darth Maul appears, and 99.9% of the Star Wars viewing public, all they know is that Darth Maul died in a pit in episode one, right? Yes. And so even they're all. If they even remember it. Yes. And a lot of people just like, I just could hear the like, what? The, like, this is... And my brother and I were looking at it like, this doesn't... What? Where is this in the timeline? Because he and I know... Because I have not watched all of Clone Wars and Rebels. Yeah. But obviously Clone Wars and Rebels do a bunch. He comes back. Yes. And in Rebels... I was just going to spoil it. He dies again at Obi-Wan's hand. Yes. In a phenomenal scene. It's so which good. I have seen the clip of. And so I'm like... I, so I knew he was back, but I also knew he died again. And then I'm just trying to piece together like... Where does Rebels take place relative to this? Yeah. How old is Han Solo? How long before A New Hope is this? It is such a con- continuity clusterfuck on the side of the highway. And it feels like you're driving past it in slow motion looking like, I need to get where I'm going, but what is happening here? It's something where I legitimately couldn't, like... Process the dialogue that, like, I had to later look up, like, people talking about the scene and, like, someone transcribed what the dialogue was because I couldn't physically process it because I was just like so many emotions were going through me in that moment none of them positive uh, because I also I saw the movie with my dad who like doesn't like you know he saw all the Star Wars movies he likes them he doesn't fucking like I think he remembered Darth Maul and remembered that he died at the end of episode one has no idea anything about any of the fucking cartoons at all and so like there's just this of me sitting there being like 
do I have to turn to my dad and explain what's happening right now? Like, do I just go, like, stand up and announce to them? Because I've watched Clone Wars and Rebels, and it's still kind of confusing to me, because I was doing the same thing of, like, when does... When, because, okay, because it, obviously it has to be before Rebels, but it also has to be quite a bit before Rebels, because even when you, like, they introduce him at the end of Season 2, he's, like, old and beat up and kind of fucked up. When does Rebels, Rebels happen, this? by the way? Uh, is it-, it's, it, it would be later than this because the Rebellion, it's, like, at the beginning of the formation of the Rebellion. Okay. So it's, like... So it's deep into that gap between 3 and 4. Yes, it's deeper than this movie would be, I guess. Okay. Like, I don't know how old Han Solo is in this movie, nor how old he is in Episode 4. Yeah. So it's like, I have no, I have re- honestly no fucking clue. And going I just to- assume that it works. And it's hard because, like, Alden Ehrenreich is actually not that much younger than Harrison Ford was when he did Episode 4. Right. But he has a very boyish look, so I assume he's like 20 in this, and maybe Han is 30 in that, and maybe this is 10 years. But I don't know. The movie but that must- wouldn't be enough time. Like, if it's, if it's like a 10 year, that's... Okay. That would not that would not make any sense to me. And of course, I I doubt anyone at Lucasfilm was talking about Star Wars Rebels figuring this out. But except for like so like the one thing I want more than like the like tell all story from like Lord and Miller and stuff is I just want a fucking audio recording of the corporate meeting that happened at Disney yes. where they decided to because Fucking Lord Kasdan did not put that scene. No, there is, is no so fucking way that Lord Kasdan, Lord Kasdan sat down. Like maybe he knows about Star Wars Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels. Maybe he even has watched them and is a fan. I hope so because they're very good. I suspect probably not. That's you know I don't want to like make any assumptions. That's that's just my sort of like image of Lawrence Kasdan is he's not somebody who has like obsessively watched all of Star Wars Clone Wars and Star Wars. He does not need to. It's yeah. okay. So I don't think he and, and like credit to also his son Jonathan like like co-wrote the, the script. I don't think they sat down and were like no. you know what would be a good treat for the fans what if we wrote Darth Maul into the, scene <laughs> into the end of this movie. So it has to have been this weird corporate decision because the one thing of like I guess when I say that there were a lot of emotions going through me and none of them were positive, that's not entirely true. Because at the very beginning of that moment, when it's just Kira calling some, whoever is uh, uh, the boss of the Paul Bettany character, that you don't know who it is yet. Which is a scene that, like, on a, like if you took out Darth Maul, like, is a decent, would have been a decent scene, like, needs to be in the movie to, like, understand her motivations for betraying him. That, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. now she moves up the ladder. So it's like, it doesn't have to be Darth Maul. But... It is this black robed figure that starts talking and and like the like first like sort of half sentence he says and like that voice sounds super familiar and then like the over the course of speaking the next sentence it clicked with me that it's Sam Witwer who is the guy who does the voice for him in Clone Wars and Rebels it's not I forget the name of the actor who does the voice over in episode 1 so yeah. it's a, it's like the same performance it's also when he stands up it is basically his design from Rebels when he We'll go into this in more detail, but when he pulls out his lightsaber for no good reason, it is the the redesign he has from Star Wars Rebels because his original lightsaber was cut in half and everything in, in Episode One. So it's like if it had just been this shadowy figure that like you, it's his identity is not important to that scene at all. It doesn't have to be important. The scene could have communicated everything it needs to be with that person. Just be clouded in, in darkness the way that like you know there's like in Avengers there's a weird like shadowy council of world leaders you don't have to know that like that one's secretly Magneto or whatever it, they can, it can just be like blank faceless people then all of this matters at their rank that's all it had to have been and then just for if you are a fan of those cartoons you recognize the performance and kind of put it together a little bit because one of the plot lines in Star Wars Clone Wars is that Darth Maul takes a bunch of the criminal organizations that are thriving in the chaos of the war and brings them together to make this like gigantic criminal like kind of mercenary force and it's a really good story arc so it makes kind of sense if you ignore specific dates probably that he would have control of this crimson dawn criminal organization and if it had just been that and it was just sam whitwer and cloaked figure i think that would have worked really well for me it would be like like cool for me and the scene just sort of like nobody really notices it for anybody else that would have worked. The problem is, he not only do you get a like peek under the cloak, which is where I thought I was probably going to stop. He it's a long he, scene. He, it's a very long scene. He throws the hood off, takes the cloak off, stands up, and is talking all the while, pulls out his lightsaber, turns his lightsaber on, and twirls it before 
the turn the, before the benches turns off. And everything about that, all of it feels like you have like twenty producers at Disney that just like sort of got in a room together. One of whom's like someone who was like a, a co-executive producer on Star Wars Rebels, and is like, well, we should hire Sam Witwer for this. He's done great work. The fans love him. It's like, okay, we'll do that. It's like we put this in, but it's like we want we have to make sure because Ray Park is credited physically as the performer. So it's like, well, let's someone else is like, well, we need to get Ray Park to be there in the in the makeup. It's like, oh, it's not that important, but sure. It's like it's like, oh, well, we need to make sure that we see all of Darth Maul because we we're thinking about selling another Darth Maul action figure. It's like that's good, and then someone's like. They might have forgotten Darth Maul, but everything that someone remembers about Darth Maul is his cool lightsaber, so we have to have him turn the lightsaber on. I was like, that's a great idea! We'll have him turn the lightsaber on and spin it so you can see it's a double-sided lightsaber. Then everybody will will they'll stand up and cheer at the fact that Darth Maul, because uh, our Facebook popularity character poll says that Darth Maul is their third favorite character behind Boba Han Solo and Boba Fett, so we have to set this up so we can do Maul, a Star Wars story. I guess... It's, but it's also something that's like, as someone who's seen and really likes all Star Wars Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels, you cannot use Darth Maul. It sh- it cannot and should not be fucking done. It is re- a ridiculous, absurd idea. It doesn't work in the timeline. It would be an embarrassment. It would confuse the fuck out of everybody. Like, just because also, you know, a lot of... The people who saw the other Star Wars new Disney Star Wars movies did not see this Disney Star Wars movie and probably don't know that Darth Maul showed up in this Disney Star Wars movie. So if they just fucking drop a trailer for a movie with Darth Maul in it, whether he's in... This is my guess, is they want to put him in the Boba Fett movie and have Boba Fett and Darth Maul fight each other because that's <sighs> I don't know. the worst fucking idea that any like fucking man-child would come up with with Star Wars is I want my Darth Maul action figure and my Boba Fett action figure to fight each other. That's got to be what they're setting I don't, to set up. I don't know because, again, they clearly wanted to do Han Solo sequels. And he's set up in this with Kira. So, I don't... I really don't know what their plan was. And I assume it's gotten a hole through its head recently. It has... I, hopefully, because it's just like... His story was told. Like, like you said... He dies in season three of Star Wars Rebels. Like, he's dead fucking dead. And so there's nowhere to bring that character. Especially, like... You know, this would have been a great idea to float, you know, three fucking years ago and to have it be in, like, an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie and have that be in, like, like continue it on from Star Wars Clone Wars. But the fact that they bring him back in Rebels, have him for the, the season finale of season two, and for most of season three, he's, like, one of the... There are two main villains, and he's one of the main villains throughout that whole season. You can't... And then he dies in that season. You can't do anything with him. He can't have he can't have any interactions with Obi Wan Kenobi. You can't do anything interesting with that character. Like you you've spent him. You you uh, like they already went through so much work to bring him back after you spent him the first time in the cartoon, and and it took a while for even me to be able to accept Darth Maul coming back in Clone Wars at all. Then they justify it, do a lot of good stuff with him, and then kill him and like finally put him to rest. You can't bring him back again. It just can't be done. I it, yeah, and it really does. You're joking, but it does feel like you got 20 suits in a room being like, there's a scene in the script where Kira talks to a shadowy figure. We need to figure out who that is. And, you know, like, they do all their... They've got an Excel spreadsheet. They've got a fucking pie chart. It is... It is... It's maybe the worst scene in all these Disney Star Wars movies yet. It's one of the, if not maybe the most inexplicable scene I've ever seen in a Hollywood movie. It, it really is. is. I, when it I, is so bizarre. And again, the I was and I was, the theater was not that crowded. Box office jokes aside, whatever. Yeah, same with mine. But I really did. You have the same thing where you could just feel the atmosphere like, like tensed up in a weird way. Well, yeah, it was both like the atmosphere tensed up. Everyone's confused, and then again, I had the extra layer of being like feeling like I was probably actually no. I know that there were two other people in the movie theater that that knew about this because when my dad and I were walking out, there were two like guys, probably like probably eighteen, nineteen ish, behind like talking behind us, talking about like. Yeah, like, everybody must be just confused out of their minds because, like, I watched it because it was actually one of them had seen the cartoons and was explaining to their friend because the friend had no idea what the fuck was yeah. happening. And it was like, and I, when I saw it happening on screen because I knew that they had brought Darth Maul back, I felt, like, physically embarrassed sitting in that seat in a way yeah. I've never experienced in any other movie of, like, 
it, it made me feel like a nerd in a weird way that like felt like like I was like in elementary school and like oh god everybody's going to know that I am the nerd that knows that they brought Darth Maul back and now they brought this in front of like the world and now everybody knows that they brought Darth Maul back and it was such a stu- and he has robot legs and it's so dumb and it made me question like my affection for Star Wars and my love for movies and fiction it was just like I had a whole my life flashed before my eyes because it is the most fucking absurd thing I've ever seen any movie ever do. It's not like, you know, it's not like a post credit scene in Marvel where they put, like, fucking Thanos in there in Avengers. And nobody knows who Thanos is, and I kind of know who Thanos is. And that's fine, because it's like, in my head, it's like, not really a part of the movie, because it's a post credit scene. Nobody it also does doesn't it. interrupt any other part of the it movie. It doesn't interrupt any part of the movie. It's not significant or important to the movie, which is why it can be a post credit scene. It's like, whatever. You can put Thanos in there, like, the fans will get it, everyone else will be kind of confused. If they stuck around for the credits. And it's like, that's it. That's fine. You can't just fucking, like, fucking slam the brakes on the movie, roll down the window and say, Hey guys, you like that Darth Maul guy? Well, check out this, buddy. We got something extra special saved for you. Like, watch. Just watch this. It's great. It's like three fucking minutes of this movie. Sitting here with fucking Darth Maul turning on his lightsaber for no reason at all. I'll say, when it, when it started, like, they're doing the turn. We start to hear the voice. I don't know the voice actor because I yeah. haven't seen all these parts of Rebels. But I thought for a second, because they've been building up. Like, there's going to be a big boss, right? Mm-hmm. We're going to see who they are. And I thought, if it's a character we know. And then when they started talking, he had a similar vocal quality enough that I thought, oh, maybe this is going to be Snoke. And I kind of like, had that thought at first before I pinned it as being Sam Witwer. Yes. Yeah. And I asked my brother, and Thomas said, yeah, totally. I thought that was going to be Because that would make sense of like... Yeah, it would still a, be dumb. It would be dumb. But, but it would an, make sense. As an Easter egg, like, okay, this is what that guy was doing before he started the First Order. I'd be fine with that. Like, yes. whatever. Get an Andy Serkis cameo. That would make some sense. And it would. And, and everybody in the. Maybe not everybody, but probably everybody based on how many people saw episode 7 yeah. and episode 8 compared to this movie. It's a very recent thing. It would yeah. make sense. They, like, they would have understood who that character was instead yeah. of it being Darth Maul. And it's just. I can't think of any. It's, it's. I think maybe the only thing that's the closest, even though I haven't seen this movie is in Pirates of the Caribbean 5 when they bring back Davy Jones, but that's even a post credit scene from having read the Wikipedia yeah. summary. I, I would say maybe the closest is... and But this whole movie is so bad it's hard to compare. The dream scene in Batman v Superman that ends with the Flash coming through time and talking to him, and it's that's, not clear okay. it's the Flash, that is close. That's close, but it would only be that if, like... 30 years ago, The Flash had been killed and nobody had <laughs> right. seen that character in a movie before. I guess not 30 years is too much. I mean, not it's, it's 20 years it's now. 20 years. But it is like, because it's also part of what makes it so hard is because the last time most people have thought about Darth Maul was in like 1999. Yes. And they haven't fucking thought about Darth Maul since. Like the general movie going audience, the vast bulk of the people watching this movie have not thought about this character at all in twenty in almost 20 years if they have ever thought about him at all because maybe they didn't even fucking see episode one because you don't need to see episode one to see this. No. It's a fucking weird spinoff of the original trilogy. It's like the, the, the fucking percentage of people who watch this movie that understand what is happening in that scene has got to be in the single digits. Yes. It's, which is just... How do you fucking put that in your movie? How is that even a thing that happens? It, it is the both the Nadir and the Zenith simultaneously somehow of Disney's Star Wars strategy. Exactly. Where it, is, yes. it is kind of like in broad terms what they're doing is micro-targeting to a certain segment of the fandom and then making these movies that, that are trying to be big, everyone on Earth is going to watch them, and not understanding that that's not what makes Star Wars a global phenomenon yeah, when it is a global phenomenon. We already, like, our culture already has this deep, deep history with Star Wars that so eclipses our cultural history with Marvel Comics. So it's yeah. like, you can feel, like, that Darth Maul scene feels so much like people, in, like, working on Star Wars in the Disney section, looking at what the people working on Marvel in, like, Disney were doing, and, and being like, okay, we, we want to do some of that. We want to yes. cater to the fan base the way that they can cater to the fan base. Not understanding how different the atmosphere is between those two things. Yes. It's like Darth Maul and Thanos are not equivalent fucking pop culture characters. You can't put Darth Maul in the movie because, like, ironically, you can't put him in because people know who he is too well. It's like nobody knows who Thanos is. And so it works if you just throw him in as a cameo character because people just assume he's a new character because for them... 
Everyone Thanos, thinks new. Everyone's yeah. new. Like, for, like, half of them, they don't fucking even know who Iron Man was. So it's like, Thanos, he's just a new villain. It's not like they don't care about the comics history. Like, Darth Maul is a character that, these, that is in this chronology of movies. He is a canonical character that has been introduced in these movies before. A movie that, like, made a lot more money and a lot more people saw than this fucking movie. And they're sitting yeah. there, like, watching the scene and they know who Darth Maul is. And they know that he died. You can't do that. Disney is not wrong to think that Star Wars is a big player franchise that they could get a lot out of for decades to come. Obviously, they're not wrong to think that. They are wrong to think that the way to do that is to try to couch these things in a sort of pandering recast of what we've had in the past. And I think it's frankly a miracle, given the creative choices made at the corporate level, how much I've liked the movies themselves that have come out. Because I think they've gotten good filmmakers and good actors. And, you know, generally I think people have had interesting ways to spin these things. Obviously, I think you get like a Ryan Johnson in The Last Jedi. And as much as it really pissed off some fanboys, that is the model for what you need to be doing. Of like, blow shit up and start over. At, but still, you know, to get there, you you also had to do The Force Awakens, which is not veering far from the path much at all, right? Yeah. Um, but I think sets it up in a good way. And but that was one movie, and they do it with Rogue One. And it's like, okay, so this is a this is Episode Four, just like the the another extra act on Episode Four, okay. And then The Last Jedi is kind of its own thing, and then you get this, and it's 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 the Han Solo movie, which sounded like a joke. It's a we, you know, it's just the whole strategy. And if their their ideas really are. A Boba Fett movie and an Obi Wan Kenobi movie. One of those sounds good to me. One of those sounds bad. But that's not going to sustain Star Wars. No, not yeah. even close. And it's something of where I mean, you know, because we both like The Last Jedi a lot. But it, it is like really. I mean, it's even to to. I mean, I say even to today. Not that much time has passed since five Last Jedi come out. It feels like five hundred fucking years since yes. Last Jedi come out, and yet it also feels like it's yesterday in Star Wars time because like these yeah. came out way too close to each other. But it divided the, stand, the the Star Wars fan base like any fucking thread I've ever like looked at on Reddit or like anywhere else on fucking Twitter anywhere. It's like you mentioned Star Wars and fucking everybody gets in a fight about The Last Jedi and it's just ridiculous and I fucking hate it. I hate everything about that fucking conversation. But there's this this weird thing of where The Last Jedi comes out and it like part of like kind of the messaging of that movie is saying like our heroes are flawed, our past, it, it, like our history is filled with mistakes and we must recognize those mistakes and move forward and strive to be better than that and like try to try to be better than our heroes and like looking at our heroes like Luke in a realistic light and not as this sort of like godlike figure that maybe some people in the Star Wars fan base wanted Luke Skywalker to be betrayed I don't know but that's like kind of like part of what that movie is saying and we both like feel that that's the direction the Star Wars should go is saying, like, let's push forward, let's do new things, let's, like, close the book on these old characters and drive into new territory. But you can't fucking put that movie out and then five months later put out, like, one of the most fan-pandering movies I've ever seen. Because to me, that is the worst part of Solo Star Wars story is how you have those fucking clunky zingers like, you know, mm, your name's going to be Solo. Like, oh, you know, Chewbacca's a real mouthful. Like, I just did the castle run in under 12 parsecs. Here's Darth Maul that stands up inexplicably and turns on its fucking lightsaber for you. you and, and then another element of this movie that drives me fucking up the wall is that they felt compelled to put... Every single thing that Han Solo ever did in his past that is referenced in episode four and five is all in this movie. It's like he gets even like stuff that's not specifically referenced. Like they like kind of linger on. This is where he gets his blaster. They linger. They linger on the weird fucking dice that were like an Easter egg in episode four that have now become a big symbol for Han Solo. Whatever. So they linger on that all the time. This is when he meets Chewie, becomes friends with Chewie. This when he. This is when he meets Han Lando. Sorry, Lando becomes friends with Lando plays the card game with Lando and wins the Millennium Falcon from Lando. This is also where the Kessel Run happens. It's like that's I am everything that I, has happened. I am genuinely surprised going back to the Indiana Jones comparison. I thought we were going to see him get the chin scar. Right. I yeah. thought for sure by the end of this movie he was going to get a cut because Harrison Ford has this famous scar from an accident he had. 
And in Indiana Jones, they do it where River Phoenix, like, uses the whip for the first time and hits his face. And it gives him the scar. It's a ch- charming little moment in Last Crusade. I'm kind of surprised the restraint that they didn't do that in this yeah. movie. And it's something of where, you know, because it came out that Alden Ehrenreich signed a deal to be on for three movies, right? Yeah. So that's where, like, all the, the sort of speculation. And then also, like, the ending of the movie feels like they're setting up for sequels. Which is bizarre because I don't know what happens in the sequel because you've done everything. Like, you've covered everything. We, like, we you, haven't seen him drop his cargo for Jabba the Hutt yet. Yes, that's, that's, kind that's of the it. one thing. But they do send him in the direction. Like, they go so far as to send him in the direction of Jabba the Hutt. Like, the only thing they don't show you just because there's, like, it's, like, even impossible for them to stretch the script far enough to justify putting this in is him signing a deal with Jabba and fucking up that, that deal. That is the only thing we know about Han Solo that he hasn't done. That he also can't do for like nine, ten years or something to fucking right. make the timeline work out. That it also feels way too early for him to um, be pointed in Jabba the Hutt's direction. I yeah. think it's like way too early for um, his in Lando's relationship to be where it's at, where it kind of feels like where this movie leaves it is the last time Han and Lando meet till the Cloud City is kind of what it feels like. Yeah, I have I no think, idea what their plan is. It's weird. Yeah, because it feels like it'll be interesting when we rewatch Empire Strikes Back to look at that scene where Han and Lando meet. Because I'm my memory uh, is that it kind of feels like the last time they met is when Han won the Millennium Falcon from Lando, and yeah. so I was happy when. Han didn't win the Millennium Falcon and that Lando left and thought, oh, if they do make more of these movies, that will be when that happens and we get to have more Han and Lando adventures because if you care that much about the continuity, there's not space to put Han and Lando having more adventures together after this movie. It's just weird how yeah. stuffed it is and it feels like it is driven by this need to cater to this like core fan base, which is exactly the core fan base you just flipped the middle finger to in the last fucking movie that is really pissed off at you. It's, it's like such a weird strategy. But it's also, let's be frank here, it's a core fan base that doesn't exist. It's sure, a core yeah. fan base that we everyone thinks exists, there are no there are these hardcore Star Wars fans who want a certain thing. There is no Star Wars movie that will satisfy them. Oh, absolutely. Let's be really fucking clear about that. There are two Star Wars movies that Star Wars fans, I'm using air quotes here, like, and that's episode 4 and 5. And every other single one you have to dislike for Star Wars orthodoxy. Yeah. And it is the most annoying fucking fandom on the planet because of that. Yes. But it is also one that because of that you cannot cater to. You should not be thinking about when making your movies. They are not a core amount of the audience and they don't matter. They literally do not matter to your bottom line creatively or commercially. Which is why it's such a mistake to to fucking like hamstring your Han Solo yes. movie by stuffing all this bullshit into it in an attempt to try to cater to that audience. That's like you were right to fucking flip the middle finger to that audience because a lot of them are assholes. Yes. <laughs> like, there's, I'm, I'm a big fan of Star Wars, but I don't truck with that side of bullshit. No. It's like, it sucks. It's like... I'm someone who likes pretty much every Star Wars movie I've ever seen other than maybe Rogue One, and I still appreciate a lot of that movie. And apparently that makes me a very weird Star Wars fan. That, yes. I, that I'm a Star Wars fan who likes Star Wars movies. Yeah, and it's like, I am still only, like, I would say I like particularly like Last Jedi out of these four movies, but I don't hate any of these movies, which is something that, like, Star Wars fans, quote-unquote Star Wars fans, like, that group of people fucking hate the prequels, and they fucking hate The Last Jedi in a way that, like, I might not even hate fucking, like, President Trump as much as these people hate The Last Jedi. I don't know if I'm capable of hating anything as much as these people hate The Last Jedi, because there's nothing in the world that exists that, like, any time it is mentioned, I am, like psychologically compelled to shout my opinion about it in the loudest voice possible on the internet. The way that, like, there seems like there's hundreds of people that are like that for fucking The Last Jedi. No, it's true. And, I mean, it's a genuine question I've been thinking about as it's become clear that Last Jedi controversy is not dissipating. I thought they would shut up by the time the DVD came out. And they didn't. And it all came out again. And I was in a, you know, I was TAing a class... And I said one day to some people who were in my class, I said, I really liked The Last Jedi. I'm going to go pick it up on Blu-ray. Oh, no, that was a mistake. Mistake? No, it's like, you know it doesn't. The, it doesn't. The continuity doesn't work. Why do you like it? It's like, I wanted to be like, you're going to get an F now, fucker. <laughs> they didn't. That didn't happen. But it's like, what? It, what is the actual path to make Star Wars a viable ongoing franchise when there is this toxicity and I'm in the fandom 
a, 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 a vocal subset of the fandom that will literally never be happy and a studio that does not seem to understand the property they have, obviously it can work because there are filmmakers who can do this. But I really do wonder if, if because this has never happened with a, like a Marvel movie in 10 years, okay, you yeah. know, like Iron Man 2 is not a critically well-received movie, but you don't go out in the world and say, you know, I actually didn't mind Iron Man 2 that much and have someone go, you're a Nazi or something. Yeah, you know? it's like, you idiot, you mor- how could yeah. you possibly have any shred of affection for that movie yeah, that no. has ruined the lives of millions of people? It's generally like, you like the Marvel movies or you ignore them. And that's probably where Star Wars has to get for it to work. It would just, I mean, there's a lot of things that I think they're going to have to reorient. I think luckily they have an inflection point coming up in that we have a year and a half until episode nine. Yeah. Episode nine is a chance to, I think, kind of put a flag in the ground and hopefully clear the board a little bit. And then maybe take some time and figure out what you want, you know? And I think, you know, hopefully just let Ryan Johnson do whatever the fuck he wants with his trilogy, because that's yeah. probably the smartest direction there. Don't overproduce these things. I mean, that's, a, that's one thing. There have to be conversations at Disney today about, like, do we really want to have three Star Wars movies a year? Or whatever we're gearing up to do? Like, do, do the Game of Thrones guys need to make their own trilogy? Like, this, we, this is only our fourth one, you know? Yeah. Like, this happened fast. I mean, it's something where I wonder how much of this is partially caused by their approach in Episode 7 of trying to hew so close to the model and style and aesthetic and, like, what to me I felt a lot like pandering to that fan base. And, like, from the trailers and the announcement and every like, they're just approaching attitude. Like, I, I get that, like, you really like that movie and a lot of people like the movie and I think it's a fine movie but as a someone who like is a big fan of the Star Wars property and like watches the cartoons, plays the games, reads a lot of the comic books, that kind of stuff, to me, it always felt like a mistake to not make it a distinct thing. And it's like they should have set it way further of like away from the rest of the stuff you knew, made it like all new characters, don't bring back the old cast as much as I have really enjoyed what they have done with the old cast. I think Harrison Ford, Carrie Fisher, and fucking Mark Hamill have all been awesome and they've done great stuff with that character with those characters. But it's hard to have, like, this, like, sort of new start in the way that the prequels felt like a fresh start. That even though you had that little bit of Anakin and, like, knowing he's going to become Darth Vader in Episode 1, so much of Episode 1 is such a fresh reset in terms of style and aesthetic and characters and everything that, you know, it raised a fan base like us that didn't have that sort of, like, clinical association like psychological association with star wars that's so fixated on on fucking episode four and episode five and you kind of tolerate return of the jedi like to me i think it helped to like give this sense of star wars can be so much and those are the people that like star wars the clone wars and like star wars rebels and like the comic books and the video games or whatever corner of star wars that appeals to them they go to that and the movies need to do that. Like, they need to but, stake their own claim and breed a new group of fans and ignore the fucking ornery old motherfuckers that are, like, standing on their lawn shouting at the kids. And here's my disagreement. Is, I, th- I think where they needed to do it was in these spinoffs. I think... That is also... Yes, that is a good I, point. I think episode... I think orienting the new main numbered movies as direct sequels to episode 6 was the right idea. I think there are specific elements of how they treat the world 30 years later that you can quibble with, but I think to get generations back in the theater and on the same page, having Harrison Ford there, having Carrie Fisher there, Mark Hamill, and then introducing the new generation, I think was the right call, especially because I think The Last Jedi dispenses with so much of the pandering so quickly. But when you... In between 7 and 8, do a movie that is visually indistinguishable from the aesthetics of those movies. Yeah. And put and then it in you do like, it... one of the most egregious bits of fan service with the Darth Vader scene at yes. the end. You know? And then you do it again two years later with Solo. And you do four movies in a row that are aesthetically of the cut from the same cloth so clearly in every way. That to me is where you have dropped the ball. Because the smart strategy to me would be to say... The numbered movies, 7, 8, 9, is where we continue the saga that you've been watching in these films so far. And in the off years, that's where we experiment and try to see what we can do to create a future for this franchise. That's what it should have been. I kind of, I I do like Solo, A Star Wars Story. I know we're getting off topic from the movie. 
But I would gladly let this movie not exist if they were instead doing, you know, something about the Old Republic or the far future or some corner of the galaxy you'd never seen. Or, you know, I don't know, go to Corellia and tell a story about a bunch of space orphans or something. I don't know. Yeah. But that would be the way to do it because here's one thing I've seen personally in my own life, like anecdotally. There are a lot of people who do not know the differences between the Star Wars movies. Like, I try to explain, like, what was the one where, you know, like, Han Solo... Wasn't Han Solo in these recent ones? I'm like, well, that was actually Harrison Ford in The Force Awakens, which is episode 7, which is part of the main numbered episodes. And like, and what's this one? It's, like, it's a Han Solo movie, but set before the episode 4, which is really the first one. Yes, the one from 1977. Han, but it's a young Han Solo. And they don't get it, you know? And there were... And this was a huge issue around Rogue One, is a lot of people did not understand that Rogue One was not surrounding episode 7, because it looks like episode 7. Yeah. And it's all and the same it, sets. And- it should have been like it, or like like either have it be something totally different, or like the spinoffs could have fleshed out the new sure, era of yeah. Star Wars. That I feel like still nobody has any idea what the identity of I, the new era of Star Wars is in terms of the world building outside of the core cast of characters that those movies feature. I really do think there is a way for them to have had their cake and eaten it too on the nostalgia in Episode Seven. And then new stuff in spinoffs. I really do think there's a way you could have done that. Yeah, I, I, I just think don't... it could have been done the way you're describing it, of, of using the spinoffs to be more experimental. I think that could have worked. But I do also think there is something about the way, especially like now that people talk about Episode Seven, in like because it's it's the conversation around the Last Jedi partially feels like they're like they've been betrayed because I think those people felt like the marketing of Episode Seven particularly like those first couple of trailers felt like it was like Disney saying like not the prequels guys like come on like the like Han Solo and the Millennium Falcon and like all that stuff like come in under our wing and it was like it felt like Disney was abandoning because I mean they literally did abandon basically everything that had to do with the prequels that was ongoing and and just say like we're going to do like it's original trilogy from here on guys we hear what you want and there are so many people being like looking at episode seven and describing it as finally someone made a Star Wars movie again in a way that like felt like insanity to me that I didn't even understand that concept and now those people feel betrayed because like did like in the last Jedi Disney like allowed Ryan Johnson to take some steps outside of that like incredibly constricted bubble that people have construct constructed for themselves around Star Wars and their nostalgia for Star Wars and I think ever catering to those people at all has in my perspective has like ultimately proved to be a mistake I think it could have if they had done made some different steps it could have worked out the way you're describing I am so frustrated with that fan that core weird whatever they are it's like contingent of people that, that call themselves fans of Star Wars that I feel like fuck them throw them to the trash abandon them they don't give a shit about this property this no, franchise it, at all in a real way and ignore them and just like go but on but it is the self-defeating like this is the the, the core problem Disney faces I yeah. think as a company with Star Wars is that even if you had every single one of those people flaming down message boards together uh, on board with your next Star Wars movie you're not going to make your money back. Period. Yeah. You're putting $300 million into a movie, you're not making that back with that fan base. It's not that big. It can't be. It literally can't be. Yes. You know? And when you are simultaneously catering to, pissing off, trying to get them back, all sorts of... You're sending a lot of mixed signals. Yes. When you're taking Donald Trump's foreign policy approach to North Korea to Star Wars, <laughs> which is basically what they're doing... Um, I don't know, that's the easiest way I could explain it. Sure. Then you're going to wind up with Solo where you kind of don't get either sides of the audience to come. Yeah. Or you get a lot of, like, people who are just going to go to it, but, you know, Deadpool 2 did twice as much money. That is, (laughs) there is no world where Disney thought, we're going to buy Star Wars and in four years we're going to be outgrossed by Deadpool 2. There is no world where anyone would have predicted that. And, you know, I don't care about Disney's bottom line. Yeah. But I do think it's one of the most fascinating things going on in film right now Absolutely. is what is going on with Star Wars. And I don't know. You know, for my part, like, I like this movie. There were problems with it, whatever. The biggest surprise to me is that it actually was pretty good and had yeah. potential to be even better, which I would not have said when it was announced. Absolutely. So good on them. You know, that's fine. But there is a larger thing going on here where Star Wars has become, again, one of the most omnipresent, but also just most confusing franchises. 
I really do think after episode nine, they're going to have to take some time and figure out how do we market this again? Because these four years have been, I think, for the majority of the viewing public, a muddle of like, what movie is which? What's the story? Where are we? What am I supposed to Yeah, what know? movies do I have to see? Which ones can I skip? Because there's something of where, because like I said, I saw it with my dad. And because we saw it uh, yesterday on Sunday. Yeah. And, and we're like, went up to my mom and being like, hey, do you want to come watch the movie? And there was something of us like, like, and she ultimately decided not to go, but it was this like, I don't even know how to explain what this movie is to someone who's not really following the news about Star Wars. Like, even like my mom likes Star Wars quite a bit, like, it wouldn't have taken that long to sort of explain the situation. But just even thinking about explaining the situation to someone that doesn't follow this bullshit on Twitter and like, like you know, the entertainment press is exhausting. I don't want to do it. Like, yeah. I don't want to have to like ask someone that I know doesn't care that much about Star Wars to go see the fucking Han Solo movie with me. Because it's too much energy to even describe how this movie exists in the first place. All I can say, Sean, is I am really looking forward to the next six to eight months that we're not going to hear about Star Wars. Yeah. Because they're going to be shooting the new movie, but they won't have a trailer ready until next year. Yes. And we have a nice, long hype break. Yeah. It was, I think, a colossal mistake for them not to release this movie in December, where it's like... But Disney can't! You know, because you know what they're doing in December? They're doing their Mary Poppins sequel that is probably going to be fucking huge because they're doing a direct sequel to one of the single most beloved movies of all time. And they couldn't. They would have canceled each other out. Disney is too big for its own good. So, yeah, so it's just like this... Because it felt like they were training people to be like, hey, December is when you show up for Star Wars movies. And then they yeah. just drop this one at the end of May. And now it's like... it's like It feels like that kind of is one of the... I think there are a lot of reasons why this movie has been a bit of a flop. But yeah. that is one of them. Is like It came so soon after fucking The Last Jedi. There's three main reasons. Let's, yeah. let's break this down. The, the first one is what you just said. Came way too soon after Last Jedi. Second one, I think, is general franchise fatigue and bewilderment with what this is. Yeah. And that, I mean, they weren't even able to start marketing Solo until the Super Bowl, February. Yeah, it's, it had it's a just very the, low tail. Yeah, it, it, it felt like it was like the movie version of Mass Effect Andromeda, where it just kept yeah. on feeling like, there's no way that this movie is coming out if they don't put yeah. out a trailer, like, e- tomorrow. The third thing is, you know, they put this out May 26th, but the previews were 25th, so it came out on the real orthodox Star Wars Day, the day A New Hope came out. And yes, for a long time, that was the Star Wars weekend. For all of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, they all hit that weekend. But it has been, you know, the last time a Star Wars movie did that was Episode 3 in 2005. It's been 13 years, and in those 13 years, a lot has changed. The last major hit that came out over a Memorial Day weekend was Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End in 2007. It's been oh, a yeah. really... That, that still has the record for Memorial Day. It's been 11 years. Records don't usually stand these days for 11 years. Memorial Day, and actually a lot of holidays, this also has happened with July 4th, where the last major hit, I think, was Spider-Man 2. Like, it's been a long time. Fuck. But, like, these big holidays... Christmas can still work sometimes, but that's not when people go to the movies. And so it's also just this outdated, like, well, it's Star Wars and it's May 25th, so clearly it'll work. And they didn't look at the last 10 years of box office receipts and realize, you're not immune to this, guys. Memorial Day is not where you put out your big movie. You might put out a medium-sized movie or something to get some like family audiences or something. But this is not when this movie comes out. Yeah, especially like, not in the fallout of fucking Avengers Infinity War. Yes. Also, that's the third, fourth reason, whatever. You're sandwiching it between Avengers Infinity War... And again, Incredibles 2 is coming out in two weeks, Mm -hmm. you know, and Deadpool 2 just came out. And it's like, there was every reason on earth to know that this was going to underperform, and they just decided to throw the money at the ceiling fan and see what happened. Yep, and and, and fire the directors, hire a new director, basically remake most of the movie, and then still put it out on this date. Because that's the other thing, doing it in that amount of time to get out on this date... Just exponentially added to the expenses. It was going to be expensive anyway because they had to reshoot the entire movie. But, like, doing it all in six months yeah. meant they had to... I mean, this movie, the reported budget is $250 million. It's probably much higher than that. And that's before you get into marketing, prints, all of distribution, all of that stuff. And not literal prints I know anymore. Don't mad at me. You know what I mean. But anyway, you know, hard drives, whatever yes. you want to call it. But, yeah, distribution. But, like... There, there's just it's there are sometimes corporations are so fucking insane of like to make the money we have to spend so much money and then get it out somewhere where it won't make any money because yeah. that's how we make the money it's exactly the Mass Effect Andromeda thing if it's like well we can't go past our fiscal year so let's do everything we can to kneecap the franchise and make sure we won't even make any money yeah. in that fiscal year I I am not an econ major I can tell you the problem with your business model 
It's yeah, it is. It's just frightening. I, I Disney scares me. It scares me more every day. Yeah, I don't know. But like, let's. I don't want to end this on a big negative rant about the state of Star Wars and the movie industry as a whole. Like, let's. Fucking this movie was pretty fucking good. It was honestly like I we enjoyed have it quite a bit. It. It's fun. Lando Calrissian had really cool capes. Yeah, I really liked capes. that last scene where he wins the Millennium Falcon. That's fun. Yeah. Cool desert. Pl- it kind of looked like a rainforest cafe, but you know, it was good as a set. You know, you know. Yeah, just like the production design, the cinematography, the the, the yeah. soundtrack, the acting. If you so like, much, this movie was so good. If you like Star Wars, and yeah. by that I mean you actually enjoy sitting down and watching a Star Wars movie, not harassing women online for liking <laughs> yeah. a different Star Wars movie. Go see it. You should. Yeah. You like it. You know, uh, see it before it's out of theaters because Incredibles two is out. Yes, or it, I think it would also be like it's a really good movie to like. I don't know. You don't rent movies anymore, but like it's like a good home movie home movie to me. Sure. Like if you you don't care that much about Star Wars, it's like, but but you this, enjoy it enough that it's like if you sit down and don't have like incredible expectations about the movie, I think you'd like be really pleasantly surprised by it. Yeah, there are a lot of virtues here that you know when you separate from maybe narrative mechanics and and some thematic mechanics are just basic pleasures. Yes. Um, it really does. Talking about home video. This does feel like the kind of Star Wars movie that I would l- have loved, like watching on VHS over and over. Yes, I love the visuals of this, but it would feel right, like in a garage on a VHS. Yeah, and you just get to. I, this might not be something that you would do. I would one hundred percent just fast forward to the part where the giant space monster comes out. Watch the part totally. until the pirate giant space monster disappears, and rewind back and watch it about three or four times. Yeah, rewinding was fun. Yes, that All was right. that was my life as a child. All right. Well, we'll be back at you next week. We're going to be doing our E3 preview episode. We're going to make some predictions. We're going to talk about where the industry is headed. And then the week after that is E3 week, where we will be doing three podcasts to cover, uh, three daily podcasts to cover the the show. (sighs) So, yeah, it never slows down. We've had a busy, busy time this year. Yeah. At least we don't have to fucking talk about Star Wars.